Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In 1536, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V returned to Europe in triumph. In fact, he was honored in Rome itself in a triumph, like a Roman triumph. Chariots and prisoners in chains, chests of treasure, and the emperor himself in purple robes at the head. At that moment, I imagine Charles could have reclaimed the imperial throne of Rome, the real imperial throne of Rome. You know, they say the Holy Roman Empire is a misnomer. It wasn't very holy, it was more German than Roman, and it wasn't truly an empire. The Holy Roman Emperor's power was in reality derived mostly from his other titles. He would occasionally serve as a unifying force for the many princes and dukes in Germany, but other than that, not truly an emperor. But after his triumph in Rome, Charles might really have done it. He was a returning hero. He was the returning hero. He had vanquished the Ottoman pirates in the battle for Tunis. He had freed the western Mediterranean from their grasp, and, well, he had reopened trade. And there is no better way to win the hearts of your subjects than making them more money. Not only had the battle for Tunis reopened many of the lucrative trade routes in the Mediterranean, but Charles and his court and his triumph were directly enriching nearly every artist and artisan in Italy. Philip Ghost tells us, quote, The emperor returned home the hero of Europe, the crusader and knight-errant who had vanquished the scourge of Christendom, and countless presses and studios worked overtime to immortalize him and his exploit. There were paintings painted and sculptures sculpted and poems written. All of the artists and writers in Italy were working on projects intended to glorify the Holy Roman Emperor. And not just the artists, but craftsmen were given work too. Think about the need for ceremonial robes and boots and uniforms that would have to be made for the triumph. Think about the horses and carriages and chariots. And think about the armorers in Italy. Charles was usually portrayed in his paintings wearing one or another of his sets of gleaming plate mail. And he usually chose to wear them in all his greatest public appearances. I mean, look them up. They're fantastic. They're always bright and shining with trim made of bronze or silver or gold, often of all three. So, in 1536, he was making a lot of people very rich. He was a popular man in Renaissance Italy. He was lining pockets all across the country and building his support, especially in Rome. Which is kind of funny. See, the symbolism of a Roman triumph in Rome is obvious, but Charles wasn't actually the ruler of Rome. I mean... He kind of was. See, Charles was in control of the Kingdom of Naples, which included most of southern Italy, but it wasn't really part of the Holy Roman Empire. At least that question was up for some debate at the time. And then Charles was also the Rex Italiae, the King of Italy. Now, the Kingdom of Italy included most of central and northern Italy at one point, but then Venice and the Republic of Genoa and the Papal States, including a host of other smaller principalities, broke away. And Rome was in the Papal States. It hadn't been part of the Kingdom of Italy for about 500 years. So the title, King of Italy, included Rome as a technicality, but the Pope was actually the monarch in Rome. Venice and Genoa sort of recognized the kingship of Charles, but he didn't actually have any power there. They were merely allies. So, he was the king of Italy, but not actually the king of Italy, except for southern Italy, of which he wasn't the king, but was actually the king. Does that make sense? The point is, after Tunis, Charles had client kings in Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and then the Netherlands, parts of France, and Switzerland, kind of, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and most of Italy. France and England were the only European states without strong personal ties to Charles. England had been in the bag until King Henry severed ties with the church and divorced Catherine of Aragon, who was Charles' aunt. And then there were the Protestant states in Germany that were on the verge of open revolt, but all of those aside... Charles was in control of most of the former Western Roman Empire. What he didn't control was the former Eastern Roman Empire. That was in the hands of his primary rival, Suleiman the Magnificent. 
However, in that department, things were looking good for Charles. The Ottoman advance into Europe had been halted at Vienna by Charles's brother Ferdinand, and Ferdinand was busy taking back some of that Hungarian and Austrian territory. Charles had officially negotiated a military alliance with the Safavid dynasty over in Persia that boxed in the Ottoman Empire between the Holy Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, and they were coordinating their efforts against the Ottomans. The Barbary problem in the Maghreb seemed to be solved after the Battle for Tunis. Charles had reinstalled his... One kind of hates to call him a puppet, but he was a Muslim king that paid taxes to Charles. Barbarossa and his pirates were on the run, and Charles stood astride the Mediterranean. However, his ear Barbarossa was not to be beaten so easily. This is episode 80, The Scourge of Christendom. The loss of Tunis was a serious blow to Barbarossa. He was the Pasha of North Africa in name, but Suleiman now had problems in Hungary and on the border with Persia. Barbarossa was supposed to take all of the Maghreb off his hands and not bother Suleiman with African or Mediterranean problems. The defeat at Tunis looked bad, and Suleiman just might decide to go in a different direction. That meant for Barbarossa, imprisonment and a likely beheading. Those were things to be avoided if possible. Plus, Barbarossa had his honor and his own position to consider. He was unwilling to return to Istanbul to inform the sultan of his defeat and to apologize without a little something to salve the wound. Barbarossa moved to Bonn and made it his acting capital. Sinan Rais, the great Jew, had a fleet of 27 galleons waiting there. Now, that wasn't all of Barbarossa's Mediterranean strength, but many of the privateers that had been his were now scattered after Tunis. So, for the moment, that was all he had to work with. But on board that collection of 27 galleys, he had a collection of flags and uniforms and sails. See, Barbarossa and Sinan Rais were in the habit of collecting the elements needed for a good false flag attack from every ship that they captured, Mostly, that meant Genoa, Spain, and Venice. All three of those nations had been present at the Battle for Tunis, and word was spreading around Europe that the triumphant king, Charles, was returning. Now, Barbarossa had his fleet readied. They raised European flags, mostly Spanish, but some Italian, and they put on European uniforms. They put away their turbans and scimitars, and some of them even cut their beards or shaved. Then... They set sail north and west for the island of Menorca. Now, Menorca is one of the Balearic Islands off the coast of Spain. They have a rich and long history. Greek, Phoenician, Carthaginian, Roman, and Vandal armies once manned and even improved upon the great fortress on Menorca. Following that, Catalan, Morocco, Aragon, and finally Spain held the islands for a time. Now, they were almost constantly under threat from the Barbary pirates. Oruj, Hizir, and Sinan Rais had all raided the islands at one point or another, and on one of those raids they captured so many slaves from one of the Balearic islands called Formentera that the island was completely depopulated. Now, they didn't capture or kill everybody on the island, just the men old enough to work oars and the women suitable enough for the harems. That left the elderly, the very young, and the disabled. And they left the island. They all went to Menorca, where they had that fantastic fortress. Now, there's a funny little quirk about the population of Menorca that brings into question a lot of the story that's to follow. Remember way back in the 1st century CE, when the Second Temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, and the Jewish diaspora sent thousands of Jews to Iberia? Those became the Sephardi Jews. Well, a few hundred years later, the Vandals invaded Iberia, and they made life really awful for the Iberian Sephardi Jews. And a lot of them fled to the Balearic Islands, especially to Menorca. It had that great fortress, which they could use to defend themselves against the Vandals, who didn't have much of a navy. Now, the descendants of those Sephardi Jews were still on Menorca, Spain had reclaimed the island long ago, but most of those Sephardi Jews were officially conversos, but 
It may have in many ways been like Jamaica. It was an island, and whenever the Inquisitors came snooping, they could all be good Catholics, but once they left, the people would be free to practice their religion, Judaism, in peace. Keep that possibility in mind here. At almost the same moment that Charles V was having his triumph in Rome, the fleet of Barbarossa arrived at the Balearic Islands. They arrived at Menorca at the Ila Pinto in the harbor outside a city called Mahon. Now they were flying their Spanish flags high out in front, and by all appearances they seemed to be a victorious squadron of Spanish galleys returning from Tunis. The occupants of Mahon had no way of knowing that Charles and his assembled forces were currently in Rome. If they were returning from their battle to Spain, which would make sense, they would have stopped at Menorca for water and rest. The soldiers that were manning the walls of that great fortress loaded all of the cannon with powder, but they didn't put any shot in. No cannonballs were loaded. Then they fired off the blanks in salute to the returning heroes. Those returning heroes returned the salute. First, they did so without shot, which was the typical procedure that ensured the defenders of the fortress that they were, in fact, Spanish sailors. Then they reloaded the guns, not just with powder, but with shot. They maneuvered their ships into a choice position, and they opened fire. Cannonballs and musket shot and arrows fell on the defenders of the fortress, and those defenders had all swarmed up to the walls to greet their incoming compatriots. This was a slaughter. The defenders of the great fortress at Menorca were broken after only a few minutes of bombardment, and Barbarossa had the harbor and the fort under his command. Now Sinan Rais took over the operations at the wharf. He captured every ship in the harbor, including one stately, beautiful Portuguese galleon that was filled with treasure. She had silver and spices from the east and all the riches of colonial expansion in her holds. The other ships there at Menorca had treasure as well, but treasure of a different sort. Most of them were galleys that were intended for the defense of the harbor, and those galleys were manned by Muslim slaves. Many of them were privateers, or former privateers, that had once served Barbarossa and Sinan Rais. Some of them even had served Oruge Barbarossa. Meanwhile, Barbarossa had all of the soldiers in the fort put in chains and loaded onto his vessels. Then he went to the mainland and into town. The events that followed would seem familiar to anyone who has listened to the Pirate History Podcast. It was not unlike the raids of Henry Morgan or Francois Lolonnais or any of the buccaneers except for one fairly major component— they took somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 suitable men and women as slaves. Healthy, Catholic, beautiful, and strong, all of them were loaded up. Then Barbarossa put his other lieutenant, Dragut, in command of the fortress. He gave the island to Dragut to hold against Spain, if at all possible, and actually he would successfully defend the fortress from recapture several times, Philip Ghost told us in 1932 that the fortress still bore the name of Barbarossa. Sadly, only seven years later, in 1939, during the Spanish Civil War, it was destroyed, utterly. Now, about the Jewish population of Mahon. They were mostly left untouched. While nearly all of the Catholic population was removed, the Jews were left there, on the island, there was some anti-Semitic grumbling that the Jews were in league with the pirates. However, most people in Europe, and Spain even, accepted that the great Jew, Sinan Rais, would have taken exception to Barbarossa enslaving Jews, so they were spared. I mean, everybody knows that Barbarossa just hates Catholics, so the Jews in this situation just got lucky. And that was accepted all throughout Europe, except for a few of the more vocal anti-Semites. But bear with me for a second here. What if those anti-Semitic rabble-rousers were actually, in this case, correct? You know, not in the baby-eating, in-league-with-Lucifer way that they like to put things, but 
What if some of the Jews on Menorca, there in Mahone, actually did help Barbarossa? I mean, Sinan Rais and the Barbarossa brothers had been running Sephardi exiles from Spain to the Ottoman lands for decades now. To the Jewish population of Spain, they were heroes, and they were bound to have had some contacts there on Menorca. And Sinan was known for his skills in smuggling and infiltration. So who's to say he couldn't have made his way into town without anyone knowing and conspired with some of the locals who wanted a little revenge on Spain? Locals who might have suggested the notion of a rumor of a possibility that the king, King Charles, might be on his way there right now and that the people of Menorca should be ready to greet him. Now, there's no evidence of this. This is pure speculation. I just love tales of oppressed peoples conspiring to overthrow their overlords. But any Spanish soldiers that might have been able to implicate the conspirators here were now safely chained up in the Ottoman galleys. So, it's a what-if, but it's an idea I kind of like. Now, Barbarossa took those 6,000 slaves directly to Istanbul. Suleiman had already by this point learned about his defeat at Tunis, but Barbarossa now had news that should make up for it. Yes, we were defeated, but we then followed it up by taking a Spanish stronghold, and my best man, Dragut, is now in command there. Oh, and by the way, here's 6,000 slaves to sweeten the deal. Suleiman accepted this apology, and he granted Barbarossa with a task. The task was to make war on King Charles, an endless, terrible war. To that end, he granted Barbarossa 200 more galleys, and he also introduced Barbarossa to a naval commander, a man who would go on to become the third leg of the tripod that propped up his ear Barbarossa, and that man's name was Murat Rais. I say that Suleiman introduced them, but Barbarossa almost certainly knew Murat Rais, or at least he knew of him. Murat was there at Rhodes back in 1522, though back then he wasn't a commander. He sailed with Piri Rais at the time, and commanded units in the Aegean fleet later on. He was, in the Ottoman navy, kind of a rising star and something of a hotshot. This was a subtle message from the sultan. I forgive you this time, but screw up and here's your replacement. Suleiman sent Barbarossa out with the ships and the men needed to do his bidding and with Murat Rais as his second in command. That team ravaged the Apulian coast of southeastern Naples. You know how Italy looks kind of like a boot? Well, the Apulian coast is the heel. Barbarossa captured city after city, he occupied additional fortresses, he brought shipping in the Adriatic and the Ionian seas to a halt. It was the raid on Menorca over and over and over again all along the coast of Italy. This was making war on Charles's empire. Meanwhile, though, Charles V wasn't the only European commander having praise heaped on him in a distinctly Roman fashion. In Genoa, the Republic was actively working toward a Roman Republican system, a Senate, a caste structure, and even a system of familial dominance. You know how in the Roman Republic, political and social power was held by different families, the Gracchii or the Julii clans, for example? Well, Genoa had organized themselves into 19 distinct ruling clans, they were already powerful Italian noble families, but now they were constitutionally recognized political bodies. And they voted unanimously, in one of the only votes that they would vote in unanimously, to award Andrea Doria, their patron, the admiral responsible for the victory at Tunis, the office of censor. In Rome, the office of censor had the power over the census, first of all, but then power over the elections, the power of veto, and power over the magistrates. It's sort of like the Supreme Court, only they gave that office to one man, Andrea Doria. Now, he refused to accept a crown. He wouldn't be a king, which made sense in a system that was working towards the Roman Republic, but, 
but he was still made the most powerful single person in Genoa. And he certainly wanted it to sound like he was reluctantly accepting this responsibility for the good of the people. Whenever Julius Caesar or Sulla or any of the men in Rome who were raised to the office of dictator, whenever they accepted that responsibility, they made it very clear to the public that it was a responsibility, even when they used their additional powers for their own good. And the ruling families of Genoa played along. Andrea Doria wanted all the powers of a king, but he didn't want all of the bad press that came with it. It's all part of that Renaissance trend towards Republican Rome. But after he was granted the censorship, Doria went back out. He started causing his own trouble in the southern Mediterranean. He captured cities in Africa. He battled Barbary fleets and sunk them. He captured slaves of his own. Now, most writers like to make a big deal about the slaves captured by the Barbary pirates, and it was a big deal. It was a horror for everyone that was enslaved. But make no mistake here, the Catholics were capturing as many Muslim slaves as they could. The difference is they didn't capture slaves from everywhere. Whenever they captured a location that they wanted to rule over, they couldn't depopulate the cities, nor could they suffer the bad press of capturing slaves there. But the privateers were another matter. Whenever they were captured, they were always put on two galleys and made to row. Now, Suleiman was understandably upset at the actions of Andrea Doria. His forces in Hungary were busy pulling back in the face of that Austrian campaign, so he decided to put those forces to use elsewhere. There was a man in the government of Suleiman the Magnificent named Lufti. He was Albanian in origin, and he was a veteran of the wars all throughout Eastern Europe and the Sack of Rhodes. In 1535, Suleiman made Lufti the third vizier in the Ottoman Empire. That was, well, the viziers were essentially the sultan's cabinet. The grand vizier was sort of the prime minister. His power was second only to the sultan. Lufti would one day go on to hold that position, famously, but not yet. Then the second vizier was kind of like a secretary of state, but the third vizier was probably the secretary of defense, kind of the top general here. In August of 1537, Lufti sailed to join his forces, which were 300,000 strong, with the fleet of Hayreddin Barbarossa. And that fleet carried the sultan himself. Suleiman left the Grand Vizier back in Istanbul in power, and took Lufti and his 300,000 men to join up with these pirates. That fleet focused on the coastal cities and the islands that belonged to the Republic of Venice. This was in western Greece and along the coast of Croatia. Within a month, that force had captured Syros, Aegina, Eos, Peros, Tinos, Carpathos, Kassos, Caetheria, and Naxos, among others. Now, that might seem hard to believe, but we have to remember that Barbarossa was not, in any conventional sense, a pirate. He was an admiral, and he had three of the greatest naval minds of his time working under him. Murat Rais lived up to the hype here. He carried out every order he was given with extreme prejudice. Sinan Rais was, well, excepting possibly Andrea Doria, the greatest naval tactician alive. Whenever it turned to battle on the water, Barbarossa turned to his friend, the great Jew. And Dragut, and Dragut would, well, one day he would go on to be called due to some of the exploits that occurred here and some of his later exploits, quote, the greatest pirate warrior of all time and the uncrowned king of the Mediterranean, end quote. This triumvirate, Dragut, Murat Rais, and Sinan Rais, well, they won Barbarossa his battles. They did so at Barbarossa's direction, but they were the men on the ground. Now, every time they took one of those many islands, they left some of their men there to hold them. That's why the sultan brought so many soldiers, so that they could capture and hold these lands. 
But about a month after Lufti and the Sultan arrived, the rest of the fleet sailed for Castro and the southwestern tip of Naples, the tip of the heel of the boot. Suleiman the Magnificent was met there by a French ambassador. The ambassador assured him that, well, this was the moment. France was on its way. Francis I had armies on the march. The Franco-Ottoman alliance was making their move. The Ottomans there captured Castro and took 10,000 or so slaves. In September, they moved on from Castro to an island called Corfu in northwestern Greece in the Ionian Sea. Now, that was where Francis I was supposed to meet them. He was going to aid them in besieging the city. But his forces weren't there. The Ottomans would find out much later that Francis had been halted in the Netherlands. His army was engaged in battle there instead of where they were supposed to be in Greece. But they didn't know that at the time, and this was a problem. The fortress of Corfu was manned by 4,000 soldiers and guarded by 700 guns. Suleiman may have brought 300,000 men with him, but you leave 5,000 men here, 10,000 men there, and it goes on and on, his forces were diminished. Philip Gose writes of Corfu, quote, He thereupon sailed to Corfu and landed 25,000 men and 30 cannon within three miles of the castle. Four days later, he was reinforced by 25 warships. The largest gun in the world was brought into action for the first time, a 50-pounder which fired 19 times in three days, a thing to marvel at. The monster's accuracy was not worthy of its size, however, as she only planted her mark five times on the fortress in a month's siege. The resistance proved too strong, and on September 17th, Suleiman sailed off the attack with the remark that a thousand such castles were not worth the life of one of his brave men. End quote. Barbarossa continued that campaign in the Adriatic, but the massive fleet of Lufti and Suleiman, they left. They returned home to Istanbul. In the end, after this about a month and a half long campaign, Barbarossa claimed his personal spoils as, quote, 400,000 pieces of gold. 1,000 girls, and 1,500 boys. I should note that nearly all of these 2,500 prisoners were of good birth. There were noble children as there, as well as the children of merchants and landowners. And then Barbarossa sent the most elegant and beautiful of the boys he had captured on to Suleiman and his court. He draped them in the finest silk and gave them bolts of silk to carry under their arms. They had bags of fine potpourri around their necks, and every one of those boys was carrying a purse filled with gold. This was how Barbarossa paid his taxes. This campaign was what prompted the Republic of Venice to write Pope Paul III back in Rome, asking for his aid against the Ottomans. This was kind of a big deal. See, Venice and the Pope weren't on the best of terms. I mean, the Venetians were Catholic, yeah, but they had occasionally fought against the interests of the Pope back in the Italian Wars. So, they were desperate. They cut deals, no doubt, and the two states joined into a holy alliance that included most of central and northern Italy. Now, some histories will tell you that the Holy League of 1538 that followed was an alliance between the Pope, the Republic of Venice, Spain, the Knights of Malta, and the Holy Roman Empire. While that is technically true, it's a little bit misleading, though. It was an alliance between Venice, the Pope, and Charles V. See, the Holy Roman Empire, what had traditionally been the Holy Roman Empire, wasn't really involved here. Any German states that leaned Protestant weren't going to join into a holy alliance, and Austria and most of Hungary, basically the rest of what was traditionally the Holy Roman Empire, had their hands full. They were either battling it out with the Protestants or cleaning up the Ottoman forces in Hungary. But when the League secured Charles's signature, they secured not only the aid of Spain, but the Knights of Malta and three other powers that in hindsight, weren't really part of the empire. There was Sicily, there was the Kingdom of Naples, and then there was Andrea Doria, 
Now, not officially Genoa, but Andrea Doria was the personal owner and commander of most of what was, in essence, the Genoese navy, such as it was. Now, the Knights of Malta were that same holy order of the Knights Hospitalier, the Knights of St. John the Baptist, the same as the Knights of Rhodes that had built a fleet of privateers to counter Ottoman expansion. And they were technically an independent power. However, they were so closely allied with the King of Spain, Charles, that, well, all he had to do was ask. They were a smaller force in 1538 than they had been in the past, but they had ten large galleys that were filled with some of the best sailors and soldiers that Europe had to offer. Now, Charles ordered his shipyards in Spain and the gunneries in the Netherlands to produce an armada, an armada of -of top-of-the-line galleons. He conscripted any acceptable galleys from his holdings in Italy, mostly Naples, and, you know, southern Italy has a little bit of coastline, so a few galleys were in their fleet. There were less since Barbarossa had arrived and started wrecking the coast, but it was still a significant navy. Andrea Doria brought somewhere around 30 galleys to the alliance, all of them personally commissioned and owned and commanded by himself. So you have the Genoese navy, about 30 strong. You have the privateer fleet of the Knights of Rhodes, which was about 10 strong. You have the Neapolitan fleet, which was significant. And then you had a Spanish armada of galleons. That's what Charles V brought into the alliance. And then add to that the papal and Venetian galleys, and you have a force of, quote, 50 sailing galleons, nearly 200 ships of war, carrying some 60,000 men and 2,500 guns. End quote. The fleet was put in the overall command of Andrea Doria. His two lieutenants were his nephew, Filippino Doria, and another Italian admiral, a Nepalese conditero named Ferrano Gonzaga. He was actually related to Giulia Gonzaga, that noble woman that had only barely escaped the clutches of Barbarossa in the past, although exactly how they were related, I don't know. A distant cousin of some sort. They were from different branches of the house. Now, all of this, this Holy League of 1538, took almost a year to organize. When everyone was ready, the Spanish fleet left Spain in August of 1538. They met up with Andrea Doria, who took command and headed south. They met up with the fleet of the Papal States and the fleet of Sicily, and then they added the Maltese privateers to their ranks, and everyone set a heading north. Near Castro, they joined Ferrano Gonzaga and the Nepalese fleet, and then they rendezvoused at Corfu on 22 September 1538, where the fleet of the Republic of Venice joined them. Now, by this time, Barbarossa was long departed from the Ionian Sea. He was well out of the region. He was safely back on his home base at Kos in the Aegean Sea just off the coast of Turkey. It was a good place for the admiral of the entire Ottoman fleet to make his home. Now, Corfu was not out of the range of Ottoman influence, so Barbarossa learned about their presence relatively quickly. He had the opportunity to send back to Istanbul and request aid. It would have been given to him. The sultan knew that defeating this assembled fleet would have been important, but the time that would have been required for messages to be sent and then received and then replied to and then the reinforcements to get gathered and the fleet to get ready and everybody to get to Barbarossa, well, that would mean weeks, weeks that the Catholic fleet would have to take Greece back. Instead, he sent word on to Suleiman to tell him what was happening and to request that aid but he wouldn't be leading that aid. Barbarossa prepared to depart immediately with just what he had on hand, and that wasn't much. He may have been the ultimate Ottoman sea commander, but the Ottoman navy was spread all around the Mediterranean. All he had there at his island were 122 galleys and galleos, and he had his commanders. Andrea Doria was a force to be reckoned with, and Ferrano Gonzaga was as well, but compared with the triumvirate that backed up Barbarossa, as well as the myriad other talented sea commanders he had in his command, well, in August of 1538, it would have been hard to say which was the better side, but things were shaping up to decide that question. 
See, this battle has often been hailed as the great fight between Barbarossa and Andrea Doria, a clash of titans, and it sort of was. It was their first meeting at sea in more than 20 years. But that may not be the most fair or accurate description of the battle to come. According to Edward Kritzler in Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, quote, While Barbarossa's name was feared throughout Christendom, he was not really a naval commander or even much of a sailor. Instead, he occupied himself with building his navy and plotting its moves, and left most of the sea battles to his favored captain, Sinan. End quote. Now, I don't know that I totally agree with his assessment. The head of the entire Mediterranean fleet of the Ottoman Empire wasn't a naval commander, but I get what I think he's trying to say here. Barbarossa was always more focused on strategy than tactics. He organized and delegated work to his lieutenants, and he chose the best to be had in the empire. He chose goals for victory, but he left the implementation of his overall strategy, the tactics on the ground, to his lieutenants. Now, Kritzler's tone seems similar to centuries of historians that called Barbarossa a pirate, but I don't think that's accurate. He was an admiral. He wasn't Blackbeard. He was Henry Morgan. He was honestly significantly more powerful than Morgan ever became. You don't want an admiral that tries to command every move in the battle. An admiral or a general on land that attempts to do that, well, he's going to fail. Instead, Barbarossa left those decisions to his lieutenants. He trusted them with it. Now, Sinan Rais may have been chief among them on the sea, but he wasn't alone. Dragut commanded a part of the fleet, and Morat Rais, the young buck who was nipping at his heels, had proven himself. He was given a part of the fleet as well. And that's the other thing here. Before you condemn Barbarossa for not, you know, stomping around the decks of his ships and bellowing orders, we need to remember, he was 58 years old here. The bellowing and stomping, well, that was a younger man's game. His talents, and they were considerable, well, they were best used commanding his sub-commanders. You leave those sub-commanders to stomp and bellow. Now, Sinan Rais was only in his 30s here, and Murat may have been as young as 20 years old. Dragut was closer to age in Barbarossa, and consequentially he was probably personally closer to Barbarossa, but he was still young enough to stomp around and bellow out orders. So yes, you could say that this was the contest between Andrea Doria, who was an older man himself, and Barbarossa. But in many ways, it was actually a contest between the sub-commanders here. The Ottoman fleet immediately made for a town called Privesa, on the mainland coast of Greece. Privesa is situated just southeast of Corfu, only a few leagues, and it commands a passage between the mainland and the outlying islands. Any force that wanted to travel from Corfu into the rest of Greece would almost have to take this passage. When Barbarossa and his sub-commanders arrived here, they were issuing a challenge. Barbarossa was daring Andrea Doria to enter into the contest for Greece, which suggests something to me. Speaking in the broadest possible strokes and making some generalizations, frankly, European and Middle Eastern and even further Eastern warfare there tends to be a divide in how they choose to fight. Europeans have a history of marching to the battlefield and issuing that challenge, while people from the Middle East and all the way to China tend to grab the advantage in warfare whenever they are able. However, Barbarossa seemed to be fighting in a very European style, which is strange. N not because he was an Ottoman commander, but because... Well, Barbarossa may have been an admiral and may have been an important man, but in many ways the reason that he's seen as a pirate is because he was among the first to fight like a pirate. One of the reasons that pirates are seen as honorless dogs to so many of the Europeans is because they fought in a fashion that, well, it wasn't European. They didn't issue challenges to a town before raiding it. They just raided at night, if possible, when everybody was asleep. 
This is a style of warfare that would have been more common in the East. You find an advantage, and you seize it. And Barbarossa did so. He fought in the same way that Henry Morgan or Blackbeard or any of the other famous names in piracy did, except here. Here he issued that challenge. It seems that he wanted to decide the fate of the Mediterranean once and for all. Or perhaps he was just trying to save the islands in Greece from conquest, to buy time for Suleiman to gather the rest of the forces of the Ottoman Empire and bring them to defeat this extremely powerful European fleet. They chose their battlefield carefully. See, Prevesa is home to a fortress that not only guards the coast, but also a narrow passage into a large bay. It was Sinan Rais that put forth the idea of capturing and manning that castle at Prevesa. Now, there wasn't actually anybody in the castle at the moment, so there was little to be lost in taking it. However, Barbarossa didn't think it was a necessary step. It would be an unnecessary allocation of resources. The bay, and thus the passage, wasn't the key to victory here. But Murat Rais and Dragut argued in favor of Sinan Rais's idea. They stepped up and stood lockstep with their brother. Together, that triumvirate convinced Barbarossa to order the castle occupied, and the guns of the castle repaired if necessary and manned. And it's a good thing they did. On 24 September 1538, Andrea Doria and the entire Catholic fleet arrived. I can only imagine how the Ottoman sailors must have felt, and the nerves that they must have had when they saw that fleet of well over twice their number, and not only more than their number, but so many bigger and better ships. However, they had chosen the battlefield. They knew what was coming, and they were ready. Doria made the first move, and it was an attempt at landfall. He clearly had the same idea as Sinan Rais to take the castle there. However, Murat Rais was there, on the sea with a squadron to complicate the landing of Andrea Doria. Now, he only had a few ships, so the Spanish and Italian forces were able to make their landfall, but they were still under fire from Murat Rais. But when they finally got ashore the guns of the fortress opened up. The Catholic soldiers were caught in a crossfire and forced to retreat while under fire. They took heavy losses in that first retreat. This was a major slip-up on the part of Andrea Doria. He was timid about taking the castle there. Had he been willing to commit his forces properly, he could have easily defeated Murat Rais. He could have taken the fortress and manned it with far more men than Barbarossa could spare. He had the ships, he had the soldiers, but he was unwilling to risk them. Maybe that's a smart move. Maybe he was saving his forces for later, but that fortress would have been a huge advantage for him. And his sub-commanders, his nephew and fellow admirals, well, they knew it was a slip-up as well. They insisted that another attempt be made at a landing and taking the castle, and this time in strength. Now, Doria agreed to this, but this was a poor decision as well. It was too late. He'd already shown his hand to Barbarossa and his sub-commanders. When the Holy League arrived the next day to take the fortress, Murat Rais didn't have the few ships he had had the day before. He had many, many more, enough ships to stop any attempt at landing, now, there was a brief skirmish here, but it was all in an attempt to withdraw. See, they went in strength, but it was in strength respective to what Murat Rais had had the day before. Once again, all of the Catholic commanders assembled, and they decided it was time to marshal the full weight of their entire fleet and to fall on the coast and the commander Murat Rais. This was a good strategy, finally. Use their numbers to their advantage. But they had a problem the wind. The reason Sinan Rais wanted to take the fortress was twofold. First, there were a lot of guns up in that castle, and Doria would certainly want them. It's best to deny your enemy anything that they want, but second, there was the wind. See, here in this small passage between the mainland and the island, the Barbary fleet was facing northwest, toward the Catholics, and the winds close to shore there were in their favor. The Holy League, though, were all facing southeast, facing contrary winds. 
They couldn't get into position for a fight like that, not a position that was favorable. But even with that handicap working against them, the entire Catholic fleet of the Holy League in all her splendor sailed in to destroy Morat Rais and to take the castle. But it all fell apart. The galleons and the other ships that relied on the wind, well, they were pushed away from the shore and further south from the battlefield. The galleys, which were able to make for shore, well, they weren't strong enough to take on Murat Rais, who had once again been reinforced. They were forced to turn around and run and rejoin the safety of the galleons. So the entire fleet decided to continue on. They may have failed to take the castle, but they were still intact. They hadn't lost anything important. So they just sailed past the castle. They just sailed past the fleet of Murat Rais. It appeared that there would be smooth sailing ahead. You see, here's why they didn't expect Murat Rais to be reinforced time and time again. They thought he was all that was there. They thought he had been sent there to stop them from taking the castle. Barbarossa was still somewhere in Greece, probably Istanbul, dealing with the Sultan to get a large fleet together. They thought that Murat Rais was all they had to deal with. If he were to sail up behind them... Well, that wouldn't prove an issue. They were big enough to destroy him if he tried to fight. So Pervesa was out, but they could continue on and complete their mission, leaving him behind. However, when dawn rose on the 28th, there wasn't any wind to carry the largest ships in the fleet. So Andrea Doria ordered the entire fleet to wait there. The galleys were to stay within range under the protective umbrella of the large galleons. But that's when they saw the Barbary Armada, the fleet of Barbarossa himself. It wasn't just Murat Rais here on the coast. It was the entire Mediterranean strength of Hizir Barbarossa. But even that was a tiny fleet compared to the Holy League, so Doria didn't expect them to attack. He ordered his ships to hold position to wait for the wind. It took a full three hours for his sub-commanders, for his nephew Filipino and the Nepalese admiral, to convince Andrea Doria, the man in command of the entire fleet of the Holy League, that, yeah, the Ottomans were here to attack them. They were in position and moving in quickly. Doria denied it and denied it. He thought it would be insanity. Nobody would be so bold or so brash or so foolish as to attack a force as strong as his— but that's what makes his ear Barbarossa and his lieutenants pirates. They were bold, and they were brash, and they were often insane. They may have offered challenge, but when the time came, they took the opportunity and seized it. They taught the pirates that were to come, the pirates of the buccaneering and the golden age, that sometimes you had to be bold and brash and insane if you wanted to defeat the might of an empire. The Ottoman fleet, when they were ready to enter battle, was situated into four units. Barbarossa and Sinan Rais sailed together in the vanguard, the center column that was aimed directly at the heart of the Catholic fleet. Now, there were other commanders and other vessels, but it was Barbarossa and Sinan Rais that led that unit. The left and right flanks were commanded by other captains. Now, all of those captains are great names in Ottoman history. However, in the history of piracy, unimportant. Their job here was to guard the shore in the case of the left flank and to keep Doria from taking the battle out to sea in the case of the right flank. The other two legs of the tripod, Murat Rais and Dragut, commanded the rear guard. They were sort of a reserve. They were to stay back, behind the battle, behind the main line, until battle was joined. And then, once fighting had commenced, their orders were to jump in, wherever any of the other ships in the fleet needed help. Should Andrea Doria flank left and try to make for the shore, they were to head there and stop him. Should they try for the sea, they were to head left and stop him. You can almost picture the Ottoman fleet looking kind of like the letter Y only turned almost upside down, facing southeast, just about 4.30 on the clock. They were creating a net to trap the Catholic League in. Now, the first contact of the battle came between that right flank, guarding the sea, and the Venetian flagship, Galeone de Venezia, the Galleon of Venice. This was a large galleon, filled with big guns, but... 
becalmed. The galleys of the right flank, well, they just surrounded her, and they took a lot of punishment at the hands of those many big guns, but slowly they began to overwhelm the galleon of Venice. I'm reminded here of the pirates in the Bay of Panama about 150 years later. They were fighting similar odds. They had rowboats and were fighting galleons. But they had, well, they had excellent, accurate muskets. They won easily, but the Barbary pirates had to fight hard with mostly bows and arrows against cannons. But they did fight hard. As time passed, it was clear that the Barbary pirates had the upper hand and were about to take the flagship of the Venetian fleet. But then the wind picked up, and Doria set his vanguard out to aid the galleon of Venice. But Dragut did his job, and he jumped in to stop them. Doria tried to get around that engagement with Dragut and Morat Rais, but the two commanders acted in unison and trapped him between them. Morat and Dragut had once again blocked the Catholic League. Now, Doria finally decided here to go on the offensive. He had the numbers, and he had the wind. It was time to use them. The squadron of Ferrano Gonzaga was joined by that of Filipino Doria, and then Giovanni Andrea Doria, another nephew, and the Knights of Malta all joined in to charge down the center of the Ottoman fleet to break Sinan Raiz and Tizir Barbarossa himself. With those numbers, that's the best way to ensure victory. Cut off the head. The ships engaged in an all-out war. With their ships, and the wind, and their commanders, who were all talented at sea, they very clearly had the upper hand. They fell on the Ottoman fleet in force. All of their cannons erupted in a line, in a way that had never been seen in the Mediterranean before, in a way that very likely had never been seen in the world before. Smoke was filling the air, and it looked like they might defeat the entire Ottoman fleet, defeat the Barbary pirates and Hazir Barbarossa himself, without losing a single vessel. However, all of the ships that had come in to engage the Barbary pirates were Venetian and Spanish. They all depended on the wind, and the wind died. The great Jew, Sinan Raiz, and Pasha Hazir Hayreddin Barbarossa, they fell on the becalmed galleons. They overwhelmed them. This was, again, a fight of bows and arrows with a few less than accurate muskets, against large galleons with big guns, but the pirates were prepared for what they had to face. Pirates from Greece and Turkey and Algiers and Tunis and every corner of the Ottoman Empire that touched the Mediterranean swarmed over the Catholic galleons. It turned to fighting on deck. This time, though, they didn't take slaves. They killed those that they met. This was intended to be a battle fought with big guns at sea, but it turned out that Damascus steel would decide the day. It was a clear defeat. In the push of galleons led by Ferrano Gonzaga and Filipino Doria and Giovanni Andrea Doria, thousands of Catholic European soldiers were dead. There were only hundreds that made it out of that push alive, back to safety. But even still... The Holy League still had the advantage of numbers. They hadn't engaged their entire forces. The Papal Fleet was there, as well as the Venetian Fleet and the Knights of Malta and the Genoese Navy. It had been the Spanish and Nepalese fleets that had taken the hardest hit. The commanders of all of those fleets urged their commander, Andrea Doria, to take the fight to the pirates, galley to galley, to let European steel decide a battle for a change. They still had the numbers, and if this was the fight it was going to be, they could win. But Andrea Doria chose not to. On the morning of the 29th, he set sail. They turned around and headed for safer waters. He broke the Holy League here. After this fact, the Venetians would blame Andrea Doria and his cowardice and his greed. There was a long-standing enmity between Genoa and Venice, and the Venetians noted quite sourly that not one of the Genoese ships of Andrea Doria had been either risked or lost. The Pope might not have passed judgment on Andrea Doria, and the Genoese still backed him, but the Nepalese also placed the blame squarely on his head, and it seems that 
Charles V may have lost some confidence in his admiral here as well. See, this was a major blow to Charles V. Had he been there, he might have changed the outcome. More ships and more men, however. England was causing trouble. Germany was on fire in Protestant revolt. Denmark and the Netherlands were also engulfed in it. And in America, on the island of Jamaica, a bunch of so-called Christians were demanding more Jews be sent out to them. And to top it all off, some Italian pirate working for Francis I of France had just captured one of his treasure galleons in the New World. Charles had a lot of problems on his plate, and this defeat was just another one of those. So he accepted it, and he tried and once again failed to get Barbarossa to change sides. He would go on, in a couple of years, to attempt an invasion of Algeria. This was an attempt that Andrea Doria was to lead, even though Andrea Doria opposed the entire idea. In the end, Charles V realized that he had lost the Mediterranean, and he gave it up to Suleiman the Magnificent. This Battle of Prevesa was the third largest battle of the 16th century. It was the last major battle in the world to be fought with a majority of galleys. And it was the galleys that decided the fight against the galleons of Spain, but it became clear in the years to follow that galleons and wind power were the order of the day. It also gave the Ottoman Empire a monopoly on Mediterranean trade. It turned the Mediterranean into a Muslim lake for 30 years. As for the Ottoman commander, Hazir Barbarossa, the Battle of Prevesa was to be his last major engagement. In victory, he chose to retire. He would go on to turn his holdings over to his son, Hassan, and to his closest friend, Dragut. Both would go on at different times to be the Pasha in Algiers and Jerba and eventually Tunis. Barbarossa went to Istanbul, where he served as an advisor to the Sultan, but no longer a commander. In a way, one could see the trio of the elder Barbarossa brother, or Rouge Barbarossa, and his friends Kurtuglu and Piri Rais as the first generation of Barbary pirates. The younger, and far more famous Barbarossa brother, Hizir, would go on to lead the second generation of Barbary pirates, alongside Sinan Rais and Dragut, and both of them would be covered in fame and accolades for the rest of their careers, and that second generation was much more successful than the first. They won the Mediterranean from the Holy Roman Empire. But the trio that was to follow, made up of Murat Rais and the son of Hizir Barbarossa, Hassan Rais, and Hizir Kurtuglu, the son of the elder Kurtuglu, would define the generations of Barbary piracy to come. And they would incorporate an influx of Dutch Protestant rebels and their Jewish allies to turn the Mediterranean into a hotbed of real piracy. Piracy that could not be controlled not by all the powers of Europe, and not even by the Ottoman Empire itself or Suleiman the Magnificent. I had trouble with today's episode. Usually, when I'm working on a show, it goes one of two ways. Either I have a plan in mind already, and I actively work toward telling that story, or... I'll be researching, and some fantastic story will unfold and grab me, and I'll find that I just have to tell it. But neither of those things happened this time. Originally, I started out with only the vaguest outline of what I wanted today's show to be about. I hoped that through my reading, a miraculous story would jump out and beg me to tell it. And a few did stand out, but none of them were stories I felt I had to tell. At least, not in any real depth. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, compared to, or maybe taken with, the story of Hizir Barbarossa, many of these stories are just more of the same. Ottoman corsairs and European navies traded territory, corsairs took slaves and Europeans sunk ships, and everybody was honored all around. And it became clear that there was just no purpose in talking about every piece of territory that the Ottomans or the Europeans traded back and forth. 
Now, those were certainly stories that were important to the people that lived through it, but after a certain point, they start to lose an emotional impact. There's nothing new here. Well, that's not true. There's a lot that's new here, but there's very little that I think I can add to some of these stories, which brings me to the other reason I had trouble today. It's a problem of scope. You see, one of the characters that I want to talk about, uh, Dragut, the drawn sword of Islam, well, he has a fascinating story, and part of me wants to tell that story in real depth, but when I start to think about the sheer size of that story, and then all of the tertiary stories that go along with it, well, I'm staring down a daunting task. The tale of Barbary Pirates really needs to be its own show. I mean, look at the timelines here, and the Mediterranean stories really match up with the Caribbean pirates that showed up a hundred or so years later. Barbarossa would probably be the Francis Drake character. The characters I want to talk about today, well, they were all quasi-legal privateers working for powerful empires. They stretched the line of legality, if never exactly going over it. Their story would be almost analogous to the Buccaneers, but it would be at least as big as the whole story of the Buccaneers. That's been, what, two years of this show? I don't want to dive into that. I'm not the person to dive into that, not in any real depth. Now, I think it would be amazing if someone did, though, and who is to say that you aren't that person? I know there are several of our patrons who have some background in the Barbary Pirates, I know that many of our European listeners have a particular interest in their stories. You see, I have an educational and cultural background in European and Atlantic history. I feel comfortable talking about these things, even if I do occasionally step on some landmines, but I have very little background in Mediterranean or Middle Eastern history. Throughout this series on the Barbary Corsairs, I've been learning the basics of a lot of that, especially the cultural side of it as I've gone along, and I'm just a lot less comfortable talking about that stuff. Now, I think it would be amazing if someone with that background, culturally and educationally, was to do that show. Imagine a British person of North African descent telling these stories with what I assume would be a fantastic accent, or imagine a Spanish or Italian person telling these stories from the European point of view. I was actually contacted by one Italian listener who... Well, first of all, she had an Italian edition of a general history of the pirates with different woodcuts in it than the regular American or English version, and they looked so cool. But I wondered what somebody like that, somebody from Italy, would think about the story of Barbary pirates, what their point of view would be on it. So if you are considering doing a podcast, a history podcast in particular, and you think you have a unique perspective... I urge you to take a long look at the Barbary Pirates. Theirs is a story worth telling, and if you feel you're the person to tell it, I think maybe you should. Really, what I want to dive into today is the era of Barbary piracy that would be analogous not with Drake and not with the Buccaneers, but to the Golden Age of Caribbean piracy. It lasted about 15 years, from 1605 to 1620 or so, and the Barbary Coast became a hotbed of real piracy, in a lot of ways, it looked a lot like Benjamin Hornigold and Black Bart Roberts and Jack Rackham and Nassau and Woods Rogers. It had the same tenor, maybe. And I'll be moving on to that story soon, but today, rather than take a deep look at the latter two-thirds of the 16th century Mediterranean, I'm going to give a highlight reel, maybe. It's going to be a show that's quick and dirty, and there's going to be a lot of names and dates thrown at you, but... It will get us where we need to go to continue. This is episode 81. From what seas are ye come? We should begin today's story by closing some of the stories of the earliest Barbary Corsairs. For example, Kurtuglu Muslihidin Rais, the elder Kurtuglu. He was... After the battle for Rhodes, he was named the Baylor Bay of Rhodes. His career was filled with clashes with Catholic ships, mostly Venetian ships, and usually he won those, but not always. But he was called away from his base on Rhodes about 1530 to traverse the Adriatic Sea hunting for Catholic vessels. 
and it was in conflict with one of those Venetian ships that he was killed, probably in 1535, that would have been three years before the Battle of Prevesa. But he left behind a son, Cartuglu Hizir, named after Barbarossa, and this younger Hizir would soon earn the title of Rais. Now, let's move on and pick up the story of the Barbary pirates in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Prevesa. Of Sinan Rais, after his performance at Prevesa, and he actually may have been the man that won that battle for the Ottomans with his fantastic tactical thinking, but after that battle we don't have any more solid historical records of Sinan, of the great Jew. There are a few mentions of a Jewish corsair, and occasionally he does get confused in the older histories with a different and more illustrious Sinan, but nothing about that is conclusive. It's unlikely that Sinan died at Prevesa. He probably would have been mentioned, but he may have died shortly thereafter. It's important to note, though, that his young son was being held captive in the court at Elba. Shortly before Prevesa, or maybe just after the battle, Sinan's son was sailing to meet up with his father when a Maltese privateer vessel captured that ship and took the young boy into custody. The story goes that Sinan's son was given to the Duke of Elba and baptized into the Catholic faith. He was to be raised at the court there at Elba to be a good subject of Charles V, and there's almost certainly some truth to that. He certainly would have been baptized, and captives who were important, or at least related to important people, well, they were usually treated well enough, as long as the ransom that they might earn was still on the table. I like to imagine that after the battle at Prevesa, Sinan Rais was killed in action, attempting a daring, if foolhardy, raid to rescue his son, but we don't know how he died. But Hizir Barbarossa, after the battle, returned to his base just off the coast of Anatolia, very near Istanbul, and announced his intention to retire. He handed all of his naval commands over to his closest and one of his oldest friends, Turgut Rais, commonly called Dragut by the Europeans. Now, Dragut took up this command. He took it solemnly, but I think he was eager for it. But Barbarossa received another message from Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. This was that second offer of titles and lands and power, and if he needed it, the whole of Africa. All he would have to do was switch sides and fight for Europe. Again, Barbarossa declined, and Charles, well, he reacted this time. He ordered Andrea Doria to raise a fleet of 80 Genoan and mercenary ships to hunt down Dragut and destroy Barbarossa's fleet. The emperor's orders regarding Dragut were to, quote, hunt him out and endeavor by all possible means to purge the seas of so insufferable a nuisance, end quote. With Sinan's son in captivity, it's possible that Charles was planning here to capture all of Barbarossa's closest friends and allies in a bid to turn him against Suleiman. If he had everyone that Barbarossa cared for, maybe he would switch sides if their lives were on the line, and as far as the capturing of friends went, that appeared to be working. Doria set out with his 80 Genoan and mercenary ships and split them up into squadrons of about 10 ships each. Now, one of those squadrons was led by Doria's nephew, a fiery, violent, and egotistical character who oftentimes got himself in trouble, and Andrea Doria actually lost quite a bit of face pulling him out of the fire on more than one occasion. But it was this nephew that heard the sound of a sustained cannonade off the island of Capraia. That's the northernmost island in the Tuscan archipelago. His squadron went to investigate, and when they arrived at the source of the cannon fire, well, whoever had been shooting the cannons off, probably the corsairs, well, they were already gone, but it was clear what that cannonade had been about. There was an ancient Roman-built seaside fortress on the island, and it had been turned into a pile of rubble. It was utterly demolished. Most of the soldiers occupying the fortress were either dead or captured, most of the women in the town nearby were held on board one or another of the galleys. 
and most of the treasure that the town had held was now being carried off by the corsairs. However, there were some townspeople remaining, and they pointed out the direction that the pirates had gone. The younger Doria, the nephew of Andrea, followed that trail, and he found the corsairs. He found them on Corsica at the Gulf of Girolata on 15 June 1540. Now, they were engaged ashore. Most of them were either careening their vessels or resting or haggling over their plunder, according to some historians. Many older historians will go into lurid detail of exactly how the pirates were treating some of their prisoners. Most of the haggling seems to have been in violent contests between corsairs over the most beautiful women and boys they had captured. But that may be all myth. The actual first-hand accounts we have show us the corsairs mostly napping or cooking or eating the cooking. It was mundane, comparatively speaking. But whatever the reality, the Catholic fleet caught the corsairs unprepared. Now, the Gulf of Girolata is a remote bay. It's far removed from any established shipping lanes, so Dragut assumed that his fleet would go unnoticed. And that is why he didn't leave any galleys to defend the harbor. So six Genoese galleys rode in and opened fire on one of the ships at anchor in the bay. It was the ship closest to the mouth of the bay. Dragut, well, he heard the cannon fire, naturally, everybody on shore did, but he saw that this was a tiny force of Catholic galleys. There were only six ships there. So he ordered his men to take to their stations and go crush those Genoese galleys. Dragut got his ships in close enough to fire, and a fierce fight ensued between his nine Ottoman galleys and Doria's six galleys. But that was exactly what the Genoese commander wanted. See, they were firing in the general direction of that galley that was closest to the harbor mouth, but they were intentionally missing. They knew that there were prisoners on board that galley, at least more than likely, and they didn't want to drown any chained-up Italians on board. They engaged the pirates there, but only to keep them occupied. The initial barrage against that galley at anchor, and the fight that they engaged in, well, it was all part of a trap. With Dragut and his nine galleys well within range, Doria sprang the trap. Fifteen more galleys sailed in and surrounded the corsairs. Now, Dragut couldn't disengage from the fight with those first six galleys. If he tried to, he would wind up taking fire from behind, and he couldn't defend from the new ships that came into the harbor without disengaging. Dragut saw almost immediately that he had been defeated. He'd been not outfought, but outthought. So he raised the white flag. Dragut and his men were all clapped in irons and put below decks on the Catholic galleys to work the oars. And they would stay there for some years. The prisoners, the Italian prisoners that had been captured by the corsairs, they were all returned home and Charles V ordered three new towers built to replace that destroyed Roman fortress that would combat any future raids from the Ottomans. But when word of Dragut's capture, and the capture of most of his fleet, reached Istanbul, the sultan sent a messenger out to Hizir Barbarossa. Barbarossa was being recalled from his retirement. The empire needed him. Barbarossa's first order of business was an attempt to secure the release of Dragut, his friend and ally. He offered exorbitant ransoms for Dragut, but all of them were declined. Charles didn't want any money, and his servant, Doria, wouldn't accept any. See, Charles's coffers were filled with Aztec gold and Inca silver. All of the riches of Central and South America now belonged to him. Charles didn't want money. His American colonies may have made him the wealthiest ruler in the world. What he wanted was Barbarossa's allegiance. That is the one thing Emperor Charles V could not get. That may have been on his mind on one day in early 1541, while his carriage was making a procession through the city of Madrid, his Spanish capital. <laughs> 
On that day, in the late winter or early spring, there was a crowd surrounding his carriage. There usually was, and they were kept at bay by the guards, but most of them were there to sing their praises of their king. But on this particular day, a haggard-looking man burst forth from the crowd and broke through the line of guards and accosted the carriage. He was wearing clothes that were stained and torn and in ill repair, but it was clear that they were once fine clothes, if at least ten years or so out of date. This haggard-looking man looked angry. Charles's guards got him under control. They lowered their lances and they drew their swords, and they were on the cusp of arresting him, or perhaps killing him, but Charles stopped them. Those clothes had once been fine, truly fine work. This piqued the emperor's interest, so he addressed this assailant and asked just who the man thought he was. The man replied, quote, I am a man who has given you more provinces than your ancestors left you cities. End quote. That may have been an exaggeration, but if so, it wasn't much of one. All of this gold and silver that was making Charles such a wealthy man, this vagrant may have been responsible for as much as a third of it. Most of the gold coins in Charles's coffers had been coined in mints established by this vagrant. And, well, there was a reason that King Charles spent his time in Madrid and not Vienna. He was the Archduke of Austria and the Holy Roman Emperor, but he left most of those duties to his brother. Why? Because at the moment, the kingship of Spain was a far more significant position. His imperial holdings as king of Spain stretched much farther than any others he held, and much of that territory, not to mention the riches and slaves that came with it, were due very directly to the man standing before his carriage in this street in Madrid. That vagrant was the conquistador Hernán Cortés. He'd fallen on hard times, though. Rival conquistadors in Mexico had been nipping at his holdings, and internal strife and division from within had toppled him. He had at least a dozen lawsuits out against him from people in the New World that were alleging brutality and an unfair way of ruling over his dominions. Hernán Cortés was just about broke. He was... He had a very large income from all of his estates in the New World, but the amount of money he owed eclipsed that. He was unable to get an audience with anybody of note in Spain, which is why he accosted the carriage of King Charles. Charles saw an opportunity here, though. He would be able to get those lawsuits brushed aside. He could see that Cortez's debts were, if not immediately paid, at least ignored and he could shelter Cortes from any further allegations. All that the conquistador had to do was to leave America behind him and work for Charles in dealing with the Mediterranean. Turns out that seemed to be a pretty sweet deal, and Cortes accepted that. Soon enough, he was joining in on the meetings with Andrea Doria and the other military officials about just how to deal with Barbarossa. Now, he was never accepted as a member of those military councils. He was never a peer to Andrea Doria or any of the other generals. He was persona non grata due to many of the allegations against him. But those generals and admirals would use his experience and his expertise. And the emperor was planning something big. Cortes might just be the right man for the job here. If we were to assume that Charles was in fact collecting Barbarossa's allies in a bid to turn him against Suleiman, that does paint his next target in a clear light. Barbarossa spent most of his time at sea, or in one or another of the seaside fortifications in Greece and Eastern Europe. He rarely spent any time at what should have been his home, doing the business of ruling. He was the king of Algeria. And he would normally have been in Algiers, but there was bigger business dealing with Charles and his forces on the sea. He had left the city in the capable hands of a man named Hassan Aga. Now, Aga was a lifelong administrator. He was a diplomat and a politician of the highest order. 
He had run the administration of Algiers when Barbarossa still inhabited the palace back in the early days, and Barbarossa left him in control of the city all the way back in 1532, back when he was called to Istanbul to stand before Suleiman. If Barbarossa was the king of Algeria, he was... he was a king in absentia. Hassan Aga was a secretary of state, but effectively he ruled over the kingdom. Now, from here on out we're going to refer to Hassan Aga strictly as Aga, because the city of Algiers was home to another notable Hassan, Hassan ibn Hizir. Hassan, the son of Hizir, he was Barbarossa's son. We'll call him Hassan, or perhaps Hassan Pasha, when he attains the title. Now, Hassan was left in the care of Aga, there in the palace of Algiers. There is an old cultural quirk in parts of the ancient Muslim world that's very similar to some of those of the ancient Greeks. Young boys would often be warded to older men who would teach them and generally take them under their wing, but there was often a sexual aspect to this relationship, especially in the higher echelons of society. Now, how widespread this practice actually was remains up to debate, but that particular quirk does still exist and is socially accepted in some of the more remote parts of the Muslim world. There are some warlords deep in the mountains of Afghanistan, or at least there were, that were notorious for this sort of thing. But despite his Greek and Muslim roots, this was a practice that Barbarossa didn't want to see going on. See, his son's guardian, Aga, was a eunuch. But the presence of the two Hassans, Aga and Hassan Pasha, well, they made Algiers a tempting target for King Charles. In fact, he had intended to take the city more than a year earlier, but there were some nasty storms that delayed that expedition. Now, though, Dragut, who had been defending Algiers, was in chains. All Algiers had to defend her now was a eunuch and a young boy. Charles, on the other hand, had Andrea Doria and Hernan Cortes to plan his assault, two of the most skilled leaders in the world. However, both of those skilled leaders were opposed to the entire idea. Cortes was a general, mostly based on land, and he thought that an overland campaign through Austria and into Ottoman-held Hungary would make better sense tactically speaking. Doria, on the other hand, thought it was extremely stupid to transport troops across the sea in a time of year when the Mediterranean was notorious for terrible storms that could arise with virtually no notice. Both of these men brought their concerns to their king, and then both of them mentioned the problems in Morocco. Morocco was in a state of open revolt and warfare. The Spanish forces would not be able to rely on a safe harbor anywhere, at least not one that would be useful for them. But Charles was the emperor, and he chose to ignore them. On 28 September 1541, a fleet of 130 war galleys and over 550 armed transport ships that carried nearly 40,000 soldiers set sail from Spain. Now, on their way to Algiers, the Knights of Malta, mostly German and Italian Knights of Malta, joined up with King Charles. It was those knights that made a landing and established a beachhead near the city of Algiers. Aga, the prime minister, ordered sorties sent out from the city to disperse those Maltese knights. This was a delaying tactic. He needed time to gather his forces. Now, all of those sorties were repelled by the Knights of Malta, but they did keep the knights fighting all throughout the night. When morning finally arrived, Charles himself landed, at the head of several hundred troops that were there to relieve the Knights of Malta. They did so successfully. The Knights of Malta were able to pull back, and Charles's forces could take over the fight. Now the sorties from the city continued, but more and more Catholic troops were arriving on the shore every hour. This was looking very much like a sure thing, a victory for Charles. And he had every reason to assume that it would be. Remember his two other expeditions to North Africa? One of them ended in the death of Arouge Barbarossa, and the second ended in his capture of Algiers about ten years ago. And he had 40,000 troops. 
Algiers had, at best, 9,000. But the process of disembarking could be a long one. It took time for the men to go from the galleys to the shore, for the men to unload all of their gear and themselves, and then for the galleys to get back to the boats. And while all of that was going on, one of those terrible, sudden storms arose, and it was violent. In only a few minutes, 33 troop transports were smashed against the rocks in the bay. Several thousand Spanish troops drowned. Now Andrea Doria was still at sea in charge of the fleet, and he was forced to pull all of the ships back into the sea. This was the only way to save the lives of tens of thousands of men. But that left King Charles, Hernan Cortes, and the Knights of Malta, and maybe as many as 2,000 troops there on shore. That was an insignificant force compared to the 9,000 that Algiers had within her walls, and that was everything they had to defend the emperor. This was a weak moment, and Charles knew it, but so did Aga. It was at that moment that the forces, inside Algiers, struck. Aga sent out a sortie in real strength this time to assault those Catholic forces. In less than an hour, he had the entire Catholic army surrounded, and it looked very much like this might turn into another modern Battle of Cani. However, the Knights of Malta, well, they had pulled back, and they were some of the best soldiers in the entire world, far better than the militia of Algiers. The Knights of Malta were able to pierce into the Algerian army, to create a defensive corridor through the army, to break that encapsulation, and they made it all the way to the center, to Charles's camp. They were able to pull the emperor and Cortez and most of the other senior officers out. They all escaped to safety, but not the entire army. Those two thousand so odd other men, well, they would all soon be pulling oars on Corsair vessels. Now Charles got away, and they actually found a ship that he was able to put himself and Cortez and all of those other senior officers on. When the weather began to clear, they were able to begin the crossing back to Europe. But only a few leagues out to sea, it became apparent that this carrick that they had found was not up to the job. All of the men and equipment and horses they had were too heavy for the little vessel. They had to make a decision, and they threw every horse on board overboard. Andrea Doria, a few hours later, would return for the emperor just outside Algiers. Now, at this point, the emperor was already gone, and the army was in chains, so Doria as well made for home. I think he probably assumed at this point that the emperor had been killed or captured. And can you imagine what that would be like? What kind of a masterstroke that would be? They were so close to losing the emperor. I mean, I wonder how much would really have changed here. Charles's brother would have been there to take up the imperial throne. He would do so about ten years later anyway. Spain would go into the hands of Philip II, and in reality his mother, until Philip came of age. But Spain was a juggernaut. Still, though, imagine the psychological blow. If the emperor had been killed or captured, how would Europe deal with that? In the end, though, Charles did get away, but he lost almost half of his forces. Most of them were claimed by the sea, but a few thousand were in Barbary hands or buried in shallow graves. Perhaps the greater loss, though, at least as it would have been seen in the halls of power, were the ships. They lost 17 war galleys and 130 troop transports. That would take significantly more time and more money to replenish than the dead soldiers. But Charles limped back to Spain nonetheless. If Prevesa, if the battle in 1538 had not determined the Ottoman dominion over the Mediterranean, at least in the mind of King Charles, this defeat at Algiers in 1541, that did the trick. Now, Barbarossa wasn't there, but he soon heard about the victory at Algiers, and he used this opportunity to put a lot of pressure on the Italians. He focused on the Italians, and as much as possible on the Genoans, in a bid to see his friend Dragut freed. But Andrea Doria, the de facto leader of Genoa, well, he had Dragut. He had him enslaved on one of his many galleys, and he was unwilling to even hear from Barbarossa on the matter. 
I do wonder if Dragut was there at the Battle of Algiers. It would have been a special type of blow. It would have really stung to have to row against his home and his allies to help his enemies kill his friends. And I imagine that if he was there, if he was at Algiers in the belly of some galley, he would have praised Allah for that fortuitous turn in weather, and he would have welcomed the storm even if it claimed his life. But while Barbarossa was killing and capturing people all along the coasts of Italy, things a little bit further north in Europe were really beginning to heat up. There was almost an alliance built between France and Spain right here. Charles came so close to negotiating a deal in which his daughter, Maria, would marry the king of France's son, the Duc d'Orléans, and get this, he would have renounced lordship of the Netherlands and Burgundy in favor of his daughter had that deal gone through. And that was essentially a dowry to who would have been his new son-in-law, the man who would one day become king of France. If they had married, if Maria and the Duc d'Orléans had married, the Netherlands would have been French territory. Imagine the ramifications of that. We might not ever have seen the Eighty Years' War. They may never have entered into revolt. There would have been significantly more Calvinist territory in France, and Henry V, that Protestant king of France, well, he might not have felt so much pressure to convert to Catholicism. France might have had a line of Protestant kings. Louis XIV might have been a Protestant king. The most Catholic monarch might have been a Protestant. And who knows, maybe that means that France never would have had a revolution, at least not the kind of revolution that they did have. Does that mean that if this alliance had gone through, we wouldn't have ever seen Napoleon rise to power? I don't know. There are a lot more subtle and perhaps more important socioeconomic issues that went into all of that, but these are the things that keep me up at night. Somebody should do a podcast about that. Regardless, the Duc d'Orléans would be unable to marry the princess, the Infanta of Spain. On a voyage through the countryside, the Duke was traveling with his brother Henry, and Henry dared the Duke to enter a plague-ridden neighborhood. Inside one of the abandoned houses there, Henry and the Duke entered into a brief duel with their rapiers, just good fun, but they stopped only when one of the mattresses was in complete tatters and blood had been drawn on both sides. They entered a plague-ridden home, cut up the bed on which somebody may have died, and only stopped when their blood was in the air. Before entering the home, after being dared by his brother, the Duc de Orléans boasted that the plague could not touch him. But that wasn't true. The Duc de Orléans died about two days later. So that marriage and the treaty never happened. King Francis I instead declared war on Spain in 1542. Now, this all matters because France's strongest ally was the Ottoman Empire and Suleiman was delighted to hear of a war between France and Spain. The war that was to follow was called the Italian War of 1542 to 1546. It was one of the later wars in the Italian Wars. Now, there was a bunch of fighting in Italy during this war, but it was really more of a general European war. Now, France was allied with the Ottomans, and that brought in Greece and Hungary and Turkey, not to mention North Africa, and a number of Protestant German and Dutch states allied themselves with France as well. Now Charles, on the other hand, had Spain and the Holy Roman Empire and Genoa. Italy was also his, but once again they were fighting amongst themselves in a war for Italy that really hadn't ended since Rome fell. Both sides had significant power to call upon, and this was shaping up to be a significant war. But then... Due to a whole bunch of problems that we aren't going to go into, including the very young Mary Queen of Scots, King Henry VIII of England joined the fray on the side of Catholic Spain. Now this was kind of a big deal because King Henry VIII of England had already separated himself from the Catholic Church, and this seemed to Charles like a very good opportunity to, oh, I don't know, marry his son to the King of England's daughter and bring England back into the Catholic fold. But like I said, we're not going to go into all that there. What we need to discuss here is the Ottoman fleet 
that was provided by Suleiman the Magnificent of 110 galleys carrying some 30,000 soldiers. That fleet was very significant, and it was led by none other than the admiral of the Ottoman fleet, Hizir Barbarossa. Now that fleet also carried the French ambassador to the Ottoman court, a man who had been living in Istanbul. His job was to make introductions between Barbarossa and the French commander, a man named Francois de Bourbon. And he did so when Barbarossa and the entire Ottoman force arrived at Marseille in August of 1543. Francois de Bourbon had ideas. He was much better acquainted with warfare on the continent than Barbarossa was, and he suggested at the very first war council they held that the Ottomans aid him in attacking the fortress city at Nice. Now, today, Nice is a part of France, but at the time it was part of an independent dukedom, and it was a part that the king of France wanted for his own. Francois de Bourbon had already attempted to take the city about six months ago, but a Genoese force, led by that nephew of Andrea Doria, had repulsed him from Nice. But Barbarossa had a much larger army than Andrea Doria. When I say that Francois de Bourbon asked him to aid the French in attacking the fortress city of Nice, he was really just asking Barbarossa to do it, and he would take credit for that with the king. Barbarossa placed the city under siege. This was just good military practice. But then he gathered the bulk of his forces together and attacked the city. There was one very large battle on 22 August 1543, and when it was completed, the city of Nice belonged to the Ottomans, or perhaps to the French. Now, the forces of Barbarossa set about doing what they always did after they took a city— they started killing and burning and robbing and taking slaves. But Francois de Bourbon and the French ambassador intervened in this. They wanted the city to be a part of France, not a burned and desolate ruin. And since it was technically the alliance between the Ottomans and the French that had taken Nice, those Ottomans were now killing and enslaving French subjects. That just would not do. Now, Barbarossa bristled at this, but this wasn't his business, this was the Sultan's business, so he relented. He ordered his men to stand down. But as the days began to war on, things grew more and more tense. There was a citadel in the center of the city that Barbarossa was unable to take. He blamed that on the fact that the French had not brought enough gunpowder for the cannons, and that was part of the alliance. The French were on the continent. They could get gunpowder through France easier than Barbarossa could carry it across the sea, and there just wasn't enough to take the castle. And this actually lost Barbarossa a key battle. The forces of Andrea Doria and Doria's nephew were able to capture that central citadel, and they were able to defend it from within with, I might add, plenty of gunpowder. Barbarossa was furious. He bellowed at the French soldiers and the French commanders, including Francois de Bourbon, quote, Are you to fill your casks with wine rather than powder? End quote. And after that, he set the corsairs loose. There were no more restrictions placed upon them. By morning, they had taken 5,000 captives. They had taken chests and chests full of treasure, and they had burned half of Nice to the ground. Barbarossa may not have wanted to jeopardize the alliance between King Francis and Suleiman, but Suleiman was the stronger partner here, and King Francis was not likely to cancel the alliance while there were 30,000 Ottoman soldiers camped inside his kingdom. And those Ottoman soldiers stayed camped inside his kingdom for many, many months, King Francis actually gave, or perhaps he lent, the city of Toulon to Barbarossa. He ordered every civilian in the city to empty it and allowed that Ottoman force dominion over Toulon. They converted the cathedral in town to a mosque, and they sounded the call to prayer five times a day. They stayed there all winter. This was actually a sound move on Francis's part, I think. It wasn't popular with the French civilians, especially not the citizens that lived in Toulon, but having a force of 30,000 Ottoman troops kept the Italian forces to the south and to the east at bay. It may have done some almost irreparable political harm to Francis I, but 
it was militarily a good move. But when spring was on the way, and the Ottomans were preparing to depart, a message arrived for Barbarossa from a French nobleman. That nobleman's name was Jean de Vallette, and he had quite a tale to impart to Barbarossa. First of all, Vallette was French by birth, and he was a peer of the realm, he was a nobleman, so he had the ability to speak with the king. But he wasn't currently allied with France. Despite his French birth and his French citizenship, which he still held, Vallette was currently an admiral in the Knights of Malta, a high-ranking admiral, and that made him by default an ally of Charles, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, Vallette had been on board one of the galleys that belonged to Andrea Doria, anchored just south of France. This was the force that Doria had marshaled to combat the Ottoman forces, but Vallette was just there to oversee the troops. Now, most of the galley slaves on board Doria's galleys were haggard and beaten. Their eyes were downcast. This was the typical stance for any galley slave. But on board one particular galley, there was a slave that stared back defiantly at Vallette, and he stared back with recognition. Vallette studied this galley slave, and then he recognized him. This slave was none other than Turgut Rais. He was that admiral and that notorious corsair that the Europeans called Dragut. Now, Vallette and Dragut had fought against one another many, many times. Dragut was an admiral in the Ottoman Empire, and Vallette was an admiral in the Knights of Malta, and they had a long and contentious relationship. But they actually knew one another personally here. Vallette, as a slightly younger man, had once been captured, and for a time had pulled an oar on board one of Dragut's galleys, the galley that Dragut typically rode on. Vallette marched over to stand before the corsair and said, perhaps sympathetically, Signor Dragut, Usanza de Guerra. It's the custom of war. Dragut replied, a bit wryly maybe, quote, Imutanza de Fortuna, and the luck has changed. These men might have killed each other, given the opportunity, but this story, if it is in fact true, shows almost a camaraderie. They were enemies, but on a certain level they seem to have been brothers in arms. The man who was in power in this situation shared sympathy. This is just how things are. And the man who was without power, currently chained up, had a bit of a joke. I remember when you were in this situation, you can see him giving that with almost a little wink. The message that Vallette sent Barbarossa there in France contained an offer. He was, as a native Frenchman, a man that loved his country, and he wanted the Ottomans out of France immediately. He was willing to mediate between the king of France and Andrea Doria. Now, Francis and Doria were enemies, but Vallette was in a unique position to talk with both of them. He said that he would even secure from Andrea Doria an offer of ransom and a potential release for Dragut. All of this if Barbarossa paid that ransom and agreed to take his soldiers and leave. Now, Barbarossa definitely wanted his friend freed. He had tried to pay a ransom for him before. But more than that, he was probably getting tired of France and of her awful winters, especially compared to the North African coast. He agreed to Vallette's terms, and Vallette stayed true to his word. According to Philip Gose in the History of Piracy, quote, Dragut was ransomed for 3,000 crowns, a bargain which the whole of Christendom, as well as the Admiral, lived to regret. End quote. Now, it was actually 3,500 crowns, but pretty close for 1932. And the whole of Christendom would definitely live to regret it. And... Vallette would live to regret it more than most. See, Jean de Vallette would go on to become the Grand Master of the Order of St. John, that is, he would be the Commander-in-Chief of the Knights of Malta. And during his tenure as the Commander-in-Chief of the Knights of Malta, he would be in almost constant conflict with Dragut. There was an army of corsairs out there, and under Dragut it actually grew larger and larger until it almost overwhelmed the Knights of Malta. And Vallette would still be the Grand Master of the Order of St. John some years later, when Dragut, now called the Drawn Sword of Islam, led what history has called the Great Siege of Malta. But 
More on that next time. Now that Dragut was safe and sound, and now that Barbarossa was eager to put France behind him, Barbarossa sailed off for the island of Elba. There may have actually been some clandestine terms in the deal worked out between Barbarossa and Jean de Villette. Barbarossa had been unable to acquire certain information for some years now, and Vallette was in a unique position to bring him that information. But whether or not Vallette was responsible for it, during his time in France, at some point, Barbarossa had learned the location of a young man who was not technically related, but almost his nephew. He had found the location of the son of Sinan Rais, Although the son of the great Jew had been baptized as a Catholic and raised since he was very young at the court of Elba, Barbarossa meant to save him in return to the Ottoman Empire with all of his closest allies and their kin. The Duke of Elba heard from Barbarossa, but he was not initially willing to part with the boy. He called the son of Sinan his, quote, boy favorite, and he adorned the young man in perfumes and fine clothes and had a habit of pulling him out to parade him around the court. He was the son of the great Jew, the notorious pirate, but he has been brought into the Catholic fold. Barbarossa didn't have time for this. His patience was short. He had been away for many, many months, and he wanted to return home. So he sent the Duke a final message. If the Duke refused to release the son of Sinan, Barbarossa would open fire. And not just any fire. It was a divine fire, a fire of retribution. Barbarossa swore before Allah and before the Prophet Muhammad and Suleiman the Magnificent that if the boy were not released to him this very day, he would raise the castle and the fortress and the entire city to the ground. Then he would invade and take every child on Elba that had survived the barrage back to Algiers where they would be converted and raised in the Muslim faith. He would depopulate the island for a generation." Barbarossa received the son of his ally on board his flagship that very afternoon. But he wasn't entirely ready to go home. He did mean what he said. He was willing to capture all of those prisoners if his demands had not been met. That means that his holds were empty. So on his way home, he stopped by Sicily and Sardinia, and then completed his voyage at the island of Ischia in July 1544. That was his last raid, and it was a good one to go off on. He captured at least 5,000 slaves on the island. But then he returned to what had been his home, the city of Algiers, for the first time in probably several years. There he saw his son Hassan, who was now a young man. Algiers was also the hometown of Dragut, who returned there after four years as a galley slave. Sinan's son, the younger great Jew, had been in captivity for almost ten years. He might not have had memories of Algiers, but he disembarked as well. Barbarossa left his fleet to Dragut in his capable hands there in Algiers, but he did give him one final order not to lose it this time. And then Barbarossa left the lordship of Algiers, of his city and his kingdom, Algeria, in the capable hands of his son. Well, his son's hands might not have been capable quite yet. He did set the proviso down that if his son were to take power, he would have to keep Hassan Aga, the eunuch, in place as the top minister. And with all of that in place, with his affairs taken care of, Barbarossa sailed for Istanbul, and for his retirement, this time for good. He died there in Istanbul the following year, apparently in peace, in bed, in his palace by the sea, not so far from his birthplace in Greece. A mausoleum was constructed by a famed Ottoman architect of the time near his palace in a place that overlooked the bay where Barbarossa had once reviewed his ships and where he frequently assembled his fleet. The tomb went untouched and revered for many, many years. It became a place of pilgrimage for Ottoman and later for Turkish sailors and a place of gathering for the people of Istanbul on certain holy days. But over the years, the tomb being so close to the sea, the elements began to take a toll. So, after World War II in 1946, the government of Turkey underwent a restoration. Now, first of all, they built an Ottoman naval museum nearby, 
on the street known as Barbaras Street, and then they commissioned a statue that would stand out in front of Barbarossa's tomb. It was facing the sea, in the same place that, according to legend, Barbarossa himself stood to oversee his ships. A poet who had died many years earlier, he wrote a poem about Barbarossa, and the authorities decided that that poem should be carved on the back of Barbarossa's mausoleum. That poem reads, quote, Whence on the sea's horizon comes that roar? Can it be Barbarossa now returning from Tunis or Algiers or from the Isles? Two hundred vessels ride upon the waves, coming from lands the rising crescent lights. O blessed ships, from what seas are ye come? End quote. Originally today, I wanted to talk about the heirs of Barbarossa, that is, Hassan Pasha, his son, Turgut Rais, known as Dragut, Kurtuglu Hizir, and Murat Rais the Elder. However, most of those characters would require discussions of Morocco and the Portuguese and their empire and an entirely different war that I'm not prepared to cover in a single episode. Now, some of that will be necessary, and we will get there, but not today. And the more I read, three of them began to look more and more like supporting characters, while one of them really stood out as a main character. So today we're going to talk about the one true heir of Barbarossa, a man who was, depending on the situation and your point of view, a corsair, an admiral, a governor, and a pirate and a man who I choose to use as our bridge to proper Barbary piracy. This is episode 82, The Drawn Sword of Islam. Last time I told you that Dragut returned to Algiers with Barbarossa, but that's actually not true. After he was freed from his stint as a galley slave, Barbarossa handed him command of the Ottoman fleet immediately, while they were both still in Europe. Dragut took that fleet and immediately went back to work. He captured all of the recent conquests of Andrea Doria, including the city of Tunis, which was quite a big get for the Ottoman Empire. And if you'll remember, Malta and the Knights of St. John were just off the coast of Tunisia. That's why Spain captured Tunis. Now, Dragut set out doing good work from Tunis, inflicting harm on the Knights of Malta all over the place. But Two years after the death of Barbarossa, his son, Hassan Pasha, the lord of Algiers, made a major screw-up. Now that's the story that involves Morocco and the Portuguese and Kurtuglu Hizir and Piri Rais and the Indian Ocean. It's an entirely different story. So don't worry about what that screw-up was. But what's important here is that the sultan, Suleiman, replaced Barbarossa's son with Dragut. He made Turgut Rais the Pasha of Algiers. Now that was a bit of a setback for Dragut. He had other business to be about, and ruling Algiers wasn't part of that, but it wasn't a huge issue, not for the moment. Dragut just did what Barbarossa had done and told Hassan Aga to run things for a while. And Hassan Aga did so, with Hassan Pasha, Barbarossa's son, in tow. Perhaps Barbarossa's son wasn't yet ready for command when Barbarossa handed him the reins of power. Regardless, Dragut went off to expand his fleet. He went to sea and into the Christian world to capture slaves, and went back to playing that old game of capturing and recapturing territory with Andrea Doria. Now there is one really great story from this period. In one event, Dragut was careening his ships in a lagoon outside the city of Jerba in 1550. Now, careening a galley or a galleo was not nearly as big a problem as careening a sailing vessel, but it was still a bit of work. But that lagoon in which they were careening only had one entrance or exit, and that was when Andrea Doria arrived and blockaded the harbor mouth. Dragut was trapped, but he held out hope until the city of Jerba fell, but then he was forced to act fast or to lose the entire western Mediterranean fleet. So he ordered a canal dug across the entire peninsula, the peninsula that created the lagoon they were stuck in, 
where digging was impossible, he ordered wooden causeways built. Then his men maneuvered their galleys through the canal. They greased up their hulls, and they pulled their ships over the wooden platforms when they couldn't keep them in the water. And finally, they all made it out safely to sea. Then they captured a few rogue vessels that belonged to Andrea Doria and sailed off free men. But throughout all this, the story was much the same as it had been when Barbarossa was alive. Andrea Doria, or one of his nephews, would capture territory while Dragut captured slaves up in Europe. But up to the north, far from the Mediterranean, the rest of Europe was getting a little bit bored. So they decided it was about time to have another Italian war. Now, this time it was called the War of 1551 to 1559, and again, Italy was not the major player in the war. It looked a lot like the last Italian war, at least up on the continent. Spain and France were fighting in the Netherlands over territory that they traded back and forth about once or twice a decade. The Holy Roman Empire was fighting in northern Italy, and in the rest of Italy, Italy was fighting Italy. The only major difference between this war and the last one were the commanders. About midway through the war, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V decided he was tired of fighting the same war over and over and over, so he abdicated all of his thrones and his titles and his power. His brother took up the role of emperor, which he'd basically been doing for decades now, and his son, Philip, became Philip II, King of Spain. Now, Philip's wife, Mary, Queen of England, told a lot of Anglicans that they would have to go die for her Catholic husband. This upset the English. They would complain, and Mary would butcher them relentlessly. But it's in the Mediterranean that things got a lot more interesting. Once again, the Sultan sent out a few hundred galleys from the eastern Mediterranean to help out in the war in the west. Once again, they were there to aid France and basically be the naval arm of the alliance. This time, though, the entire force would be led by Dragut, who would earn his nickname on this campaign, the Drawn Sword of Islam. Now, initially, the Sultan's fleet was led by an Ottoman admiral named just to confuse the matter here, Sinan. Now, this was not Sinan Rais, the great Jew. This was a man named Sinan Pasha, who was a vizier back in Istanbul. The Italian historian Pekevi said of this Sinan, quote, Sinan Pasha was a proud and megalomaniac man who would not listen to the opinions and complaints of others. He had a cold gaze, end quote. And if that were true, then it really must have rankled when the sultan told Sinan Pasha, upon setting out in no uncertain terms, quote, do whatever Turgut says, end quote. Now, Barbarossa had, well, he'd essentially conquered the North African coast, and he'd always had a certain amount of autonomy from Istanbul. The sultan was busy dealing with affairs in Turkey and Arabia and on the border with Persia, not to mention the troubles in Hungary and Egypt. North Africa and the Western Mediterranean and Western Europe, while interests of the sultan, were not affairs with which he could be directly bothered, so he left those in the hands of Barbarossa. And it appears that Dragut inherited some of that autonomy, maybe most of it. Hassan Pasha didn't have the influence or the strength or the trust of the sultan to do things without the sultan's express orders, but Turgut Rais did. And before Dragut got on with the business of prosecuting the war and helping out their allies, France, he had a plan. He had intentions for all of those galleys and all of those janissaries sent by Suleiman. Instead of sailing for Sicily or Italy or France, which he was supposed to do, he sailed for Malta. The Knights of Malta were understandably unnerved by the sudden arrival of hundreds of galleys and thousands of troops, and these weren't the galleos and corsairs they were used to seeing, this was a large force of heavily armed war galleys and janissary troops which were significantly better armed and better trained than the regular corsairs. And see, the Knights of Malta weren't part of this war. They were allied to Spain, but in this war they hadn't signed up and joined on as they had in the previous war. They were 
sitting this one out. But Dragut, well, he changed his plan, or maybe it had been his plan from the start, but instead of attacking Malta itself, he captured another island in sight of Malta, a subsidiary island. He captured every person on the island suitable for slavery and sailed away for Africa. Now, I'd like to read here the description of the Knights of St. John given by Philip Gos, and keep in mind, most of this is hyperbole, but there are a few nuggets of truth in here. Quote, they built fortifications on a scale never before attempted, and galleys which were the terror of every Muslim vessel, whether legal or illegal, afloat. Their success became proverbial. If the knights had possessed a sufficient number of ships, it is probable that the Turks would have been swept off the Mediterranean. Their fleet numbered only seven large galleys. Six of them were painted bright red, the flagship of the commander, a somber black. They were of exceptional size, rowed by Mohammedan slaves, and heavily armed. For many years the Knights of St. John lived by plundering the enemies of the faith and led lives devoted to chastity, piety, and charity. End quote. Let's unpack that, shall we? We need to discuss our cast of characters as well. Taken in context, what the author is saying here about the fortifications on a scale never before attempted... Well, that's actually sort of true. What he's saying is that the Knights of St. John, after receiving Malta and their alliance with Charles, they built new fortifications on a scale that they had never before attempted, which was the case. And as we will see, well, they were impressive however you looked at them. The island of Malta was far better defended than Rhodes ever had been. But Malta wasn't their only outpost on the Mediterranean. They had two cities— They had Tunis until Dragut came in and took it, and then they had the city of Tripoli, which was also impressively defended. It had high, strong walls guarded by cannon batteries and some of the better soldiers that Europe had to offer. The Knights of Malta themselves were among the best. Now, Gose's statement that the ships of the Knights of Malta were the terror of every Muslim vessel, well, that's probably less true. Now, their galleys were impressive, I'm not disputing that, and if it came down to a one-on-one fight between a Maltese galley and an Ottoman galley, the Maltese would take the day, almost without question. However, that kind of fight rarely came to pass. Barbarossa and Sinan Rais and Dragut and all of the early Barbary corsairs, well, they sailed with several galleys at a time, at the least. They rarely feared a galley of the Knights of Malta, unless there were several of them to fight, at least on the sea. And the claim that Ghost makes that, with sufficient numbers, the Knights of Malta could have scoured the Mediterranean of the Ottoman presence. Well, Spain, the most powerful empire in the world, couldn't do it. Spain and Italy and the Holy Roman Empire, and sometimes England combined, they couldn't do it all together. Now, if their navies had been as skilled and as powerful as the Knights of Malta, sure, they could have done it. But the whole point of an elite fighting force is that they are elite. They are better than the average sailor and the average soldier. Europe just didn't have the money or the manpower or the will to mount such a force. The Knights of Malta were such a small fleet because that's all they could support. And then the size of the fleet and the pious, chaste, charitable, one might even say humble nature of the order, that's all nonsense. Without getting into any of the rampant conspiracy theories about the Knights of Malta, they were still far from reclusive, pious monks living in poverty. They were almost privateers. They were, at the least, privateer lords. They did have that very small fleet of very large galleys, Whenever they were called upon to aid in any major military matters against the Turks, the Knights of Malta filled their galleys with their knights and created a strong backbone for any marine fighting force. There's a reason that the Knights of Malta are always the first to come in enemy contact, the first to land on the beach to create a beachhead. It's D-Day every time the Knights of Malta are out there fighting. But their strength was not in their private navy, at least not just in their private navy. See, 
The Knights of Malta engaged in many of the same practices as the later English governors of Jamaica or the French in Tortuga or the Baylor Bays of Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli. They hired mercenary sailors to act as privateers. Now, these privateers weren't straddling the line of piracy like Henry Morgan or Lolonay or even someone like Francis Drake. They were sanctioned by a holy order and, in their eyes, had God himself on their side. And sometimes they would even have a Maltese ambassador, one of the Knights of Malta, on board. They had a strong sense of legitimacy, in their own eyes as well as those of Europe. They were soldiers of God, carrying on the Crusades at sea. But in reality, in tactics, they weren't that different from the buccaneers. They were mariners that had blown their last chances in their home countries. They went to work for the Knights of Malta to get that letter of mark and search for their fortunes at the expense of others on the sea. Now, these men weren't Knights of Malta. They weren't members of the order. What they were was a necessary evil. See, the crowned heads of Europe were through fighting the Crusades. The Holy Land was lost. Jerusalem belonged to the Sultan. So they stopped funding the Knights of St. John. It was a crusader order from the Crusades, but there was no more crusade to fight. Now, Italy and Spain saw value in the Knights of Malta as an elite mercenary navy, but only if they didn't have to give them any money. The Knights of Malta solved this problem with privateers. They gave them pieces of paper and turned them loose. It was very much like when Governor Modiford sent Morgan out to raid the Spanish Main. It brought in funds to the Knights of Malta, and it kept the seas safe. It kept a force of well-armed, provisioned eyes on the sea to see exactly what those Barbary pirates were up to. So while the Knights of Malta, the actual knights, might observe the forms of their religion, we can banish piety and chastity and remember that the Knights of Malta were, in form, independent privateer admirals with a veneer of sanctity. But I think that appearance outside Malta of Dragut and his fleet and the subsequent attack on one of their protectorates was kind of a dare, maybe maybe a threat or a challenge. Here's what I've got, and I'm coming for you. And Dragut was coming for the Knights of Malta, but not at Malta, not yet. Instead, he sailed for the last stronghold on the North African coast, Tripoli. Now, since 1530 or so, that had been a stronghold for the Knights, and it was very well defended. Neither Barbarossa nor Suleiman had ever dared attack Tripoli. But Turgut Rais had this large, impressive Ottoman fleet and his thousands of Janissary soldiers, and he meant to take that opportunity to oust the Knights of Malta from Tripoli. See, Tripoli was the home of all of those privateers that worked for the Knights of Malta. They didn't put in at the island of Malta, that was for the knights and the nuns and everybody who belonged to the Holy Order. But at Tripoli, they could all gather. The navy there was commanded by a knight named Gaspard de Valier, a Frenchman. Now, he had only 30 other knights with him, but there were at least 600 mercenaries in Tripoli and perhaps hundreds of privateers that might be in or out of the city at any given time. The mayor of Tripoli was none other than Jean de Valette, another French knight. He was that commander who had at one point been a captive to Dragut and had negotiated Dragut's release from Andrea Doria. Now last time, when Philip Ghost called the ransom of Dragut, quote, a bargain which the whole of Christendom as well as the admiral lived to regret, end quote, the admiral in question was Jean de Villette and this was the first moment that he might have seriously begun to regret his decision. Dragut arrived outside Tripoli in late July 1551. He blockaded the harbor there and constructed three gun batteries on the shore. They were aimed directly at the fortress of the Knights of Malta. This was to be a proper siege. No food was to go in or out, and no one was to leave. 
But after establishing the siege, Dragut waited around. That was the first tactic in a siege. But he was waiting for something. He was waiting for the French ambassador to the Ottoman Empire to arrive. And when he did, the ambassador protested this entire attack. He said that this was not part of their alliance treaty, nor was it a part of the plans of France. And it put the lives of several French commanders of the neutral Knights of Malta at risk. The official position of the French army was to stand against this attack. Now, Barbarossa had had his eyes on political power, and whenever he was faced with a decision like this, he usually made the politic decision, and he may have capitulated here. But Dragut and Sinan Pasha were not interested in politics, at least not in the same fashion. So they refused to lift the siege until the Knights of Malta had left Africa for good. The ambassador, the French ambassador, threatened to sail for Istanbul, to leave this fleet behind, and then to go tattle on them to the sultan. So Dragut occupied his ships. He sent janissaries to take the galleys of the French ambassador, and then he brought them in to be used in the blockade of the harbor. The ambassador was asked, very politely and with all honors, to stay on the ship and shut up until they were done here. And with that little problem out of the way, the Corsairs opened fire. Once the firing began, they didn't let up for six days. It was a ceaseless bombardment, day and night. And on August 15th, those mercenary soldiers inside the fortress mutinied against the knights in charge. They took it over, and they surrendered. The Maltese knights had no choice but to surrender as well. Now, they weren't massacred, as one might assume. They were allowed to leave in peace, however, without their ships. A small galley carried them home to Malta. When they got back, Gaspard de Vallier would be stripped of his rank and thrown out of the order for his rank incompetence in the Battle of Tripoli. However, a few years later, when Jean de Vallette was raised Grand Master, well, he'd been there. He saw how bad it got, and he reinstated Vallier. As for the French ambassador that arrived to officially protest, his story lends us a much-needed dose of piratical flair here. It certainly makes it feel a lot more like a proper pirate tale to have a stuffy, well-dressed, aristocratic, perfumed Frenchman show up and protest the actions of these violent sea raiders. But back in Europe, literally nobody believed his story. It was the general consensus among all of the enemies of Spain that this French ambassador had actually gone there to aid Dragut to give him some important information. But after the fact, the French government and this ambassador spread that story to make him seem more legitimate. Now, this was the first military strike in this Italian war. And really, it shouldn't be counted as part of that war since it was an unsanctioned attack on a non-combatant state. But after Tripoli, Dragut finally got his act together and sailed off to prosecute the war properly. He went to Sicily, he went to Italy, and when he left to go attack these enemies of France and the Ottoman Empire, the entire Ottoman Armada went with him. But that's actually a problem here. The entire Armada wasn't supposed to. Half of them were supposed to stay with Sinan Pasha and go elsewhere. Those corsairs, though, kind of hated Sinan Pasha, and they just left when Dragut did. Now, Dragut hated Sinan Pasha as well, but when he caught wind of the fact that everybody was sailing somewhere close to him, he sent word to all of the corsairs that if they were supposed to stay with Sinan Pasha and they hadn't done so, well, that was mutiny, and he would punish them unto death if need be. So it seems here that Dragut had gotten on track. He'd gotten with the program, so to speak. Now, the Sultan may not have known precisely that Dragut was going to go attack Tripoli, and it certainly wouldn't have been sanctioned under their war aims, but it does seem suspicious that the Sultan told Sinan Pasha to do whatever Dragut said, and immediately Dragut goes to do something that's, well, basically illegal. And it sounds and it feels kind of piratical, but 
It may have been a clandestine operation sanctioned by the Sultan himself. Not part of the war, but he was sending out those ships anyway. Might as well take Tripoli. Now, I won't go into detail about the war, not even in the Mediterranean. It's just another war. And frankly, I get tired of talking about wars in which one imperial power fights another imperial power over scraps of land with not a care for the soldiers that were actually bleeding and dying. This happened a lot, and frankly, there's nothing interesting in it for me. It was seasonal warfare, and to the aristocrats at the top, it was almost a sport. I find interest in the wars where the soul of a nation or a people is at jeopardy. Wars like the Thirty Years' War or the English Civil War, but this Italian war is just one in a long line of European wars that didn't really amount to much. They made war in the Ottoman fashion in the case of the Corsairs under Dragut. I'll sum up that war in a message sent by that French ambassador to King Henry II of France. Quote, the Turks burnt all the castles and villages on their descent for twelve or fifteen miles along the shore, and without making any stop, the said captain of the fleet, he means Dragut, following the coast, intended to spread the flames from one end of the coast to the other. End quote. They attacked Sicily and Sardinia, they attacked the Papal States and Naples, basically anywhere that a navy could reach was ravaged by the Franco-Ottoman alliance. It was war. Dragut, though, was the most successful commander among anyone in the fleet. Sinan Pasha and the French fleet commander, a man named Baron de Lagarde, well, they were having plenty of their own successes, but not as much as Dragut. However, relations became strained among this allied force. There was the rivalry between Dragut and Sinan, but more than that, the French and the Ottomans were at odds. Dragut had a bad habit of not showing up to rendezvous with Baron de Lagarde. When the French were interested in some piece of tactically or perhaps politically important territory, well, Dragut didn't usually care. He cared more about attacking the places that would allow him to kill Catholics, the places where he could take slaves, the places where he could earn huge amounts of plunder. Those were the things that made him popular with the men, and they made him very popular. All of the corsairs and the janissaries were filling their pockets in a very privateer fashion, but Sinan Pasha and de la Garde, their men were fighting and dying over fortresses and small tracts of land. Now you'd think that this would cause troubles with the alliance on a greater scale and anger Suleiman the Magnificent, but while the French were upset, Suleiman was quite the opposite. See, the French continued to default on their debts over and over again. They owed the Ottoman Empire a lot of money, and they weren't paying up. The ambassador, that French ambassador, had personal debts back in Istanbul that he couldn't repay. So Suleiman gave Dragut a huge amount of leeway that was intended to earn some of that money back. So instead of reprimanding Dragut, Suleiman gave him Tripoli. He made him Pasha of Tripoli. And then Dragut defeated a fleet commanded by Andrea Doria at the Battle of Panza. That was the big climactic battle in this war. He captured galleys, he rescued the galley slaves, and enslaved Catholic soldiers there. He didn't lose a ship either. The Sultan was very happy with his performance. So in addition to making him the Pasha of Tripoli, Suleiman gave Dragut the position of Baylor Bay of the Mediterranean, that is, the Grand High Admiral of all of the Ottoman ships in the Mediterranean Sea. That was a position that had not been filled since 1545, when Barbarossa retired. Dragut had taken up command of the fleet, but he didn't have this position handed down from on high. There was another battle in the war, the Battle of Jerba in 1560, that once again Dragut won. Now this was the culmination of the war, and actually it was fought after France and Spain had signed a peace treaty, so the war was kind of over, but Dragut wasn't ready to end it. Now, as for the Ottoman relations with France, the military alliance after the war was over, for the moment. The alliance in general, the Franco-Ottoman alliance, would stand until Napoleon, but their agreement to fight together was over. That alliance would be strengthened, though. When the Dutch revolt begins in a few years' time, France would agree to aid the United Provinces in their war. 
The Barbary states would agree to get involved, the Sultan would agree to get involved, and Queen Elizabeth would agree to get involved. And one Moroccan Jew would bring Dutch Z-rovers down to the Barbary states. He would bring them to Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli, and that would set off a new wave of piracy, the likes of which the world had never seen. More on that next time. For now, though, Dragut had another battle to fight. After that sudden appearance of Dragut and the fleet off the coast of Malta and his subsequent conquest of Tripoli, the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta ordered preparations to be made to face a potential invasion. Now, sometimes I imagine Malta as an island fortress, but it's really not. Malta is a large island. It's got several cities and many smaller villages. Now, when the Knights of St. John acquired Malta, they inhabited the Fort St. Angelo on what's called the Grand Harbor of Malta. Strategically, this is the most important place on the island. If you wanted to launch a military invasion, this was the place to do it. And I'm going to put maps up of both Malta, the Grand Harbor, and the Mediterranean in general at the website if you want a visual image here. Now, the Grand Master brought in an Italian architect named Antonio Ferramolino, who had been building fortresses that frustrated the Barbary Corsairs for years all across Italy and the Adriatic. He came in and expanded Fort St. Angelo to include bastions and curtain walls and gun batteries and trenches. Essentially, he modernized this ancient fortress for the gunpowder age. He constructed defenses that were unmatched in the world thus far. In this case, Philip Ghost seems to have actually been correct. These may have been some of the most impressive and extensive fortifications in the world. Any army that hoped to take Fort St. Angelo from the beach would have to make landfall under cannon fire from several sea-level batteries. Then, they would have to take those batteries. Once they did so, they would turn the batteries on the fortress, but they would have to climb a sandy hill toward the walls under fire. And then, once they were at the walls, they would have to scale them, somehow, facing down cannonades from three different directions. Now, a beachhead attack was not exactly the best idea here. So, if they decided to use their ships to blow a hole in the walls of Fort St. Angelo, they might assume that they were safe. They could storm the beach and take the breach that they had made. But when they did, they would find a second wall waiting there, with towers once again all around them. Fort St. Angelo was impenetrable from the sea. But... If the pirates managed to make landfall on Malta from another angle, they might take the Fort St. Angelo from the rear. So the Grand Master called in another architect, Pedro Pardo, to work on the other defenses of the island. Pardo designed two additional fortresses to stand on outcroppings of land that could all guard the approaches to one another. They were in strategically perfect locations, and no ship would be able to enter the Great Harbor without permission. The first of these forts designed by Pardo was the Fort St. Michael. Now, this appears to have been an impressive fortification. It had a seaside wall and gun batteries, it had a curtain wall and a large courtyard for the army, and then it had a central keep that had a dozen different towers in it. Its main purpose was to guard the land approaches to Fort St. Angelo. Sadly, Fort St. Michael was demolished in 1921 to make way for a school, the second fortress, though, was the Fort St. Elmo. Elmo was a star-shaped fortress. It stood at the very tip of a peninsula that guarded every approach to the Great Harbor. There were bastions that guarded every possible landing point on the beach. They were supported by a dual-layered curtain wall between them. Then there was the upper fortress, the Keep of Elmo. It had trenches and moats and batteries that guarded all of the land-based approaches down the peninsula. There were also several towers and five bastions. The Fort St. Elmo was a masterwork, and Pedro Pardo was understandably proud. The completion of Fort St. Elmo was overseen by the new Grand Master, Jean de Villette. He had plans to move the military operations of the order to Fort St. Elmo. He wanted to build an even larger walled city on the peninsula. But he hadn't yet gotten around to that by 1564. And in that year, he oversaw a campaign in which dozens of very high-profile Ottoman ships were captured. 
We're talking about ships carrying viziers and emirs and bailer bays, pashas of cities like Cairo and Alexandria, and the former nurse of the sultan's favorite daughter. So Valette wasn't terribly surprised when his spies in Istanbul reported plans to attack Malta. He may have been, after a campaign like that, planning on it. He may have felt ready for it. The Italian estimates of the Ottoman forces that began to marshal reported 9,000 cavalry from all around the empire. There were 6,000 elite janissaries, and there were some 11,000 mercenary soldiers. That's 28,000 soldiers. To contrast that, there were only 500 Knights of St. John on the island of Malta. Now, they had Spanish volunteers as well, and a militia on the island made up mostly of exiled Greeks, and there were various other European adventurers, mostly Italian, to the tune of about 6,000 men. However, in their commander, Jean de Valette, the Knights of Malta had something special. Philip Gose writes of him, quote, The order was fortunate in having for its grand master, in its greatest hour of peril, a man of outstanding wisdom and bravery, the seventy-year-old Jean de Villette. He had been one of the defenders of Rhodes forty-three years before. He was the most experienced pirate fighter alive. He knew every leading corsair by sight, and most of them by name. End quote. Now, there are some conflicting sources that inflate the Maltese forces, and Vallette himself said that there were only about 16,000 soldiers in the invading force that would actually make landfall, and that's probably true. The navy, the Corsair navy, would stay on their galleys for the most part, and the mercenaries would only be brought in to fight if absolutely necessary. That would avoid the necessity of paying out sums for death and injury but the entire Ottoman force was to be led by the drawn sword of Islam, the hero of the last Italian war, Turgut Rais. But he wasn't the one bringing them to Malta. At first, coming from Turkey, command was split between the general and the admiral. Both were instructed to defer to Dragut once they arrived, but the Ottoman forces arrived before Dragut did, at dawn on Friday, 18 May, 1565. The Knights of Malta were ready to defend their island. They knew this attack was coming, so they must have looked on in some confusion when the fleet sailed in close to the harbor, then turned around. They sailed southeast, then they turned around again and sailed northwest, past the harbor, to anchor a few miles away. Now we've seen what happens when these split commands between land and sea forces fall into disarray and disaster. Now, the emperor attempted to circumvent that when he gave Dragut overall command. That was a smart move. But until he arrived, the general and the admiral saw an opportunity here to grab the glory and the honor and the recognition for themselves. The general wanted to make landfall immediately, far from the harbor. He wanted to capture the capital of Malta, which was inland. Then he wanted to march on the fortresses while the navy bombarded them from the sea. The admiral wanted to not do that. He wanted to bombard the fortresses immediately and then send the army in to clean up whatever was left. Personally, I think the general had the right idea here. If they took the capital, they could cut off any support to the Knights of Malta. Then they would split the attention of the knights between the land and the sea. There would be men manning the gun batteries and preparing to defend from the landward side. Their attention would be split between these two fronts when a third force, the Corsairs under Dragut, could sail in and, acting as marines, take the fortress. But the following day, they appeared to have agreed upon a plan. The fleet sailed in and prepared to make landfall southeast of the harbor. Jean de Valette saw their position and surmised what they were about. The landing zone was closest to Fort St. Angelo and St. Michael. Vallette saw, though, that their plan was to take Fort St. Elmo. He might have just been a skilled enough tactician to see the possibilities here. From their position, they could guard lines of supply out of range of all of the fortress's cannon. From there, they could set up batteries on a hill that would be in range of Fort St. Elmo. That may have just been the brilliant mind of Jean de Vallette, 
Or he may have had word from his spies that this was the plan from the beginning. Either way, though, he reinforced Fort St. Elmo with half of his men and half of his guns. He wanted to ensure that the fort would not fall. The Ottomans got their batteries in place that evening, and at dawn began a barrage on the walls. Though this was truly a well-constructed fortification, there was real punishment being delivered upon Fort St. Elmo, but the walls withstood it. The Ottomans, though, they were safely out of range of any return fire up on their hill. Every night, the commander of Fort St. Elmo had his wounded that had been defending the fortress ferried across the harbor to Fort St. Michael. From there, he could bring back supplies and reinforcements and orders. This went on for about a week, a nearly constant barrage with supplies and reinforcements getting through. But then Dragut arrived. He brought with him 12,000 Barbary Corsairs and dozens of galleys. Once again, Ghost writes, quote, Dragut was now preparing to disembark his terrible Berbers in the exultant belief that the last chapter of the Crusades was now to be written in the blood of the Crusaders' heirs. End quote. We don't know that to be true. We don't have the writings of Dragut to tell us that he believed that. Dragut may have just wanted to take a very important tactical position away from a powerful enemy, but it does sound cool in the words of a European. The Corsairs joined the blockade on the harbor, but then Dragut ordered his ships that were small and light enough to go further in. They would be able to stop some of the ferry crossings. Then Dragut went to land, surveyed the situation, and ordered another battery to be built to guard against any other potential crossings. From both the harbor and the land, Dragut was able to stop all of the ferries and all of the supplies and all of the reinforcements and all of the orders. And then he brought his 12,000 corsairs ashore. There was an Italian soldier there named Francisco Balbi, and he wrote an account of the siege with a few fairly glaring exaggerations, but he wrote of the corsair force, quote, The darkness of the night became as bright as day due to the vast quantity of fires. So bright it was that we could see St. Elmo quite clearly. The gunners were able to train their pieces upon the advancing Turks, who were picked out in the light of fires. It was an impressive force. On the 3rd of June, a battalion of Janissaries captured one of the batteries that was facing the hill outside Fort St. Elmo, and thus they gained control of the moats and the trenches that led up to the walls. This was quite a victory. The commander of Fort St. Elmo managed to smuggle a letter over to Vallette. He begged leave to either surrender or abandon the fort, but Vallette was not willing to give up such an important piece of territory. He refused. Dragut ordered the bombardment increased. He wanted Fort St. Elmo abandoned or reduced to rubble. This went on for two weeks when, on the 17th of June, Dragut was standing on the hill, overseeing this cannonade against Elmo when something happened. The Maltese recorders will tell you that one of their gunners made a miracle of a shot. The Ottomans will tell you that one of their cannons backfired and exploded in shrapnel and gunpowder. Whatever the case, though, Dragut was struck with heavy shrapnel. He was taken away, and five days later, he succumbed to his wounds and died. Later that same day, the Ottoman cannons finally broke through the walls of Fort St. Elmo. They were able to enter the fortress and killed every man that was defending her. There were nine knights who were not killed, they were captured, and a few soldiers jumped into the harbor and swam to safety, but they killed hundreds, maybe thousands of soldiers. The general of the Ottoman forces there took command of the army overall, and he had crosses built from the rubble of the fort. Some of them would have been from recognizable places. Then he had the heads of those nine knights removed. He affixed them to the crosses, and floated them across the harbor as a message to the other knights of Malta. All of a sudden, back in Europe, everyone began to pay attention. Philip II, the Emperor Ferdinand, Henry of France, and even Queen Elizabeth made mention of how dangerous it would be if these Ottoman Turks managed to take Malta from the knights. Everybody began to raise forces for relief missions. 
But nobody raised anything terribly substantial, and nobody went in haste. They had decisions to make. Was this a war? Who was fighting? Was the Ottoman Empire involved, or was it just pirates? Would France fight the defenders here, or would she stay out, or would she join our side? Nobody knew the answers to these questions, so the crowned heads of Europe moved slowly. It took six months for anyone to arrive, and then that was only an expeditionary force of 600 Spanish volunteers. They weren't there to defeat the Ottoman forces, they were merely there to relieve some of the Maltese forces defending against them. And in that entire time, the Barbary Corsairs were allowed to ravage the inland parts of Malta. With the general in command, they took the capital, they took the villages, and they took slaves. Once they were done with that, they focused their attentions on Fort St. Michael. Now this was a long and inconclusive siege. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and virtually nothing changed. Every day the Knights of Malta lost forces. Every day the Ottoman forces lost many times that number attempting to take Fort St. Michael, but despite that they still had the numerical advantage. However, that rivalry between the general and the admiral who had led this force before Dragut showed up, well, that reared its head again. The army and the navy were at loggerheads about how to proceed, and the corsairs, well, they followed Dragut. Most of them didn't have any love or any loyalty toward the Ottoman Empire, and Dragut was dead. Most of the corsairs, 12,000 or so soldiers, were ready to go home. And then that Spanish volunteer force arrived, 600 soldiers strong. Now that wasn't a large force, but that set off a panic among the Ottoman forces, who were essentially leaderless. The corsairs didn't have one overall leader. They had fallen into separate ship commands. The general and the admiral couldn't get their act together, and things turned into tumult. Rumors began to spread among all of the Ottomans that a force of thousands and thousands was on its way. The whole of Spain was about to fall on them. The Holy Roman Empire, France, and England and the Netherlands, everybody was on their way to destroy these corsairs. Now, none of that was actually coming. The only force that had any chance of making it to Malta was an Italian force that had maybe a thousand soldiers. But this panic worked its way through the ranks and destroyed all all of their morale, all of the will that these soldiers had to defeat the Maltese knights, faded away. The corsairs, without Dragut in charge, began to slip away. Then, the admiral, who wanted to take a different route than the general, threatened to take his entire fleet, all of the ships, back to Turkey, without the army. He was just going to leave all of the Ottoman forces on land. And the general, well, he capitulated. He agreed that they should return back to Turkey and report what had happened to the sultan. Soon enough, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20-25,000 Ottoman soldiers were returning home. They call this the Great Siege of Malta, and perhaps I didn't do it justice. It was six months of near-constant warfare on the island. But it's been imbued with this huge amount of importance to almost a mythological level. It was seen as a victory for Catholic Europe. It was painted as the new Battle of Tours when the advance of the Muslim horde was stopped. And it sort of was, but without Dragut to lead them, and without his corsairs working for the empire, the navy and the army of the Ottoman Empire this far away from Turkey just didn't have the same spirit. And the navy, without Dragut there to lead them, began to decline. He was the overall commander, the commander-in-chief of their entire Mediterranean force, and nobody stood up to replace him. There were sea commanders who could have replaced him, talented commanders. Murat Rais was, well, he had the love of the corsairs, which seemed to be necessary to control the western Mediterranean, but he was more interested in piracy than commanding imperial forces. And perhaps that had more than a little to do with the fact that Suleiman the Magnificent, the lawgiver, the greatest sultan in Ottoman history, arguably, died the next year. Ottoman sea power, 
began to decline further. Venice would declare war on the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean, and four years later there would be another climactic battle, the Battle of Lepanto. It was the largest battle since the days of the Roman Empire, fought at sea with rowing vessels. Lepanto is a battle that's often used to mark the end of Ottoman domination in the Mediterranean, and by some it's used to define the beginning of the Age of Sail. And perhaps that's a good point of distinction, but I choose instead to look at the Great Siege of Malta, when the will of the Ottoman Empire fell. The commander of the Knights of Malta, Jean de Vallette, was lionized all across Europe. He was painted at one point leading the charge with sword in hand at the last stand of the Knights of Malta. This was a last stand, though, that never took place. There were several desperate defenses to ward off attacks from the Ottomans, but the entire force never rallied to defeat the Corsairs in glorious battle. And Jean de Vallette probably never held a sword in real battle. By this point, he was an old man. And, along with Jean de Vallette, Dragut's myth grew too. Ghost tells us that Dragut stood firm until the very end. Even after the cowardly Ottomans fled, Dragut and his pirates stayed resolute to finish the fight and die against the swords of the knights. And, of course, that never happened. Dragut was killed early on in the siege, but it was told that way back in Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli. Dragut was buried in Tripoli in what was a glorious tomb. And with that, we're going to leave this first era of Barbary piracy, of Barbary corsairs. The distinction between pirate and corsair is today one of semantics, one which we're going to discuss on this show. But it proved very real for a number of European diplomats. There was one Englishman who found himself very nearly beheaded for calling a legitimate privateer, in the eyes of the sultan, a pirate. However, these seafarers, Oruj, Hazir, Dragut, all of these first wave of Barbary corsairs were true privateers working in the interests of the empire. In the book Pirates of Barbary, historian Adrian Tenniswood sums up this entire early age of Barbary Corsairs. He ties this age not only to the Barbary pirates, the real pirates that are to come, but to the pirates that would come later, the pirates of Nassau and Port Royal and Madagascar. Tenniswood writes, quote, Their legacy in the Mediterranean was threefold. They confirmed the strategic importance of North Africa and of Algiers in particular. They showed the economic benefits which could accrue to a relatively poor state like Algiers from well-organized privateering. And they left behind them a group of effective and battle-hardened corsair captains. The Barbary Coast offered the brave, the unscrupulous, the thing they wanted most of all, prosperity at sea. End quote. Next time we're going to move on. We're going to introduce the man that connected Morocco, Amsterdam, and the Barbary states of Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli. And we're going to explore how those earliest adventurers from Amsterdam and Morocco and England to the Barbary states, how they learned for themselves and then showed the world exactly what someone who was brave and unscrupulous enough could do. 